in the matter between Action SA and the Electoral Commission of South Africa. Good morning, Justice and Bar, members of the court. I appear on behalf of the applicants, uh, the, the applicant in this case, together with my colleagues, Ms. Muvangwa and Mr. Raikane. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Mr. Bishop, you can proceed and put yourself on record. Mr. Bishop, he seems to have frozen. Justice Mba, uh, Mr. Bishop seems to have frozen. Uh, may I try to contact him on his mobile to see what the problem is? Yes. Thank you, Judge. Justice Mba, my leader, Mr. Bishop, has just indicated that uh, he's experiencing some technical difficulties with his teams, but he is dialing back in. He should be he should be back online any minute. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lutuli. I hope he's not trying to abscond and leave me to. <laughs> well, baptism of fire. <laughs> and and I've had a, and I've had a few before you, Miss Pertha. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> uh, good morning, judges. Can can you hear me? Yes, is that yes. Mr. Bishop? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Judge Mbah, I'm very sorry. My, my, my team's just crashed. I'm, I'm not sure why. I apologize. Okay. It's fine. Uh, so I, I appear for the respondent together with my learned friend, Mr. Lutuli. Thank you, uh, both counsel. We've already met. Uh, I'm Justice Mba. I'll be the presiding uh, judge in this matter with me and my colleagues, Justice Shongwe, Justice Mushidi. And Ms. Pata, a member of the court. Um, as I explained during our meeting earlier, we are going to afford each one of you 10 minutes at uninterrupted address to set out your roadmap. Um, and then thereafter, we can then debate issues, ask questions if and when necessary. You have indicated the timelines that you've set amongst yourselves, between your, uh, yourselves, and uh, well, I, I, we won't really strictly hold you to those, but obviously we would like the matter to be, to run smoothly and to be finalized as quickly as possible. Uh, like I indicated, uh, we've gone through your heads of argument, they are quite detailed and they do delineate the issues properly. So you don't really have to go word by word or page by page with your heads. You can be assured that uh, we have familiarized ourselves with the contents and where basically you stand with the issues. Over to you, Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Justice Mba. May it please the court. This matter was brought as an urgent application on 5th October 2021. Action SA brought the application in order to compel the Electoral Court, uh, sorry, the Electoral Commission, pardon me, to include its name on the ward ballot paper. The ward ballot paper provides a space for an abbreviation of a political party's name. The ward candidate and the, and the party's logo, so three identifiers. 
Action essay's name does not appear on the space allocated for an abbreviation. Uh, Ms. Hassim, Ms. Hassim, sorry, the lights have gone off in this room where I am. Could I just see what's going on? Uh, please, sorry. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Hassim. You may proceed. Sorry about uh, that. Justice and Bayern members, the full background to the application is set out in the introduction of our heads of argument. Essentially, election, uh, Action SA applied to be registered as a political party on 7 December 2020. This it did in terms of Section 15 of the Electoral Commission Act and by completing the requisite forms under the regulations for the registration of political parties. The Commission Act, the regulations and the application forms all do not require Action SA to have an abbreviated name. It's common cause that's act that Action SA did not register an abbreviated name when it applied for registration as a political party. The reason for this is that Action SA selected and designed its name to serve as its only name identifier that also meets the requirements of an abbreviation in the Act. It did not want a separate abbreviation or a separate acronym. The name is one, Action SA, and it serves all functions. This is evident from the fact that it is eight letters long and it contains the acronym for South Africa with no spaces between Action and SA. When it came to Action SA's attention on the 2nd of October, uh, 2021 that is, when the draft ballot paper was presented to political parties, it pointed out the omission to the commission officials and requested that its name be included. The Commission refused on the basis that Action SA had not registered an abbreviation. Action SA's case is that the exclusion of its name in the ward ballot paper, whether as a result of the decision relating to Action SA's registration papers or as a result of the design of the ballot paper, is unlawful, unreasonable, and is a violation of its political rights under Section 19 of the Constitution. In support of this case, I will address the following topics in turn. First, I will deal with the argument by the Commission that it did not take a reviewable decision. Second, that the Act and the Registration form does not require an abbreviation. Third, that the stance adopted by the Commission by insisting that Action SA's request can't be addressed because it did not select an abbreviation in circumstances where the registration form did not require it is unreasonable and violates Action SA Section 19 right. Fourth, the stance adopted by the Commission is also contrary to its duty, Section 100 of the Constitution. Fifth, that the power to design a ballot paper does not extend to imposing an obligation in conflict with the Commission Act. Six, and finally, I will address the topic uh, of just and equitable relief, uh, and that uh, our relief to include Action SA's name on the ward ballot paper is just and equitable relief. So let me begin then with the decision. The Commission argues that there was no decision taken to refuse uh, to include Action SA's name on the ballot paper. This is wrong. It's wrong in law and it's wrong in fact. First of all, the definition of decision in the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act is very broad. It lists, it provides a definition and then it lists the kinds of decisions that qualify under PAJA, including doing or refusing to do any other act or thing uh, Ms. of an administrative um, name. Ms. Hassam, uh, yes. uh, we, we are 
losing some of the words you are saying. Most certainly I am. Yes. Uh, try to try to you know be close to your mic and not move a you know uh, move your body a lot um, because we are losing some of the weight. Okay. I don't um, know if if other uh, members of the court are experiencing the same problem as I am. <clears throat> Yes, I am. Uh, it's breaking up a bit. Yeah, it's breaking up a bit. You are breaking up a bit, Ms. Hassan. Justice Mba, uh, I will go a little more slowly and try not to move. Can you hear me better now? Yes. 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 Um, Thank you. I'll try, to, I'll try to keep myself still. Um, <laughs> yes. It's not by nature, but I'm going to do my best. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, what I was referring to was the definition of decision in Paja and the broad nature of the definition. In our heads, we refer to the Bhagwan decision at paragraphs uh, 15 and 16 of our heads. Um, it offers a guide to determining whether a decision is taken. But I wish to draw the court's attention to paragraph 11 in Bhagwan, where the court stated as follows. Ultimately, the facts in each circumstance will have to be evaluated to determine whether or not the process referred to above have been complied with or to what degree these processes exist for purposes of deciding whether administrative decision had been taken. When applied to a set of facts, it will be a matter of degree to determine whether an issue is ripe for review adjudication on the basis that uh, the decisional process has been completed. In other words, it's a factual inquiry. So with that in mind, let us look at the facts in this case. The facts show the following. In Justice Mba, I will spend a bit of time on this because it's important to take the court through what actually happened. It began when Action and Say objected to the omission of its name on the ward ballot paper. As I said, this was when the draft ballot paper was presented to uh, political parties. The first response it was met with uh, is that its name was not reflected on the ward ballot paper because it did not choose an abbreviation on the registration form. This was, Actually, this was, this was on the 2nd of October, am I right? This was on the 2nd of October, the first interaction with the, communi uh, with the um, commission. Um, that was a verbal interaction. Um, and the fact that it took place is reflected in the record uh, because after that, Action ASA wrote to Mr. Shaburi, who is the Deputy Chief Electoral Officer, to explain its position. That is to be found uh, at page 37 of the record. If we turn to page 37 of the record, there is a letter, an email from Mr. Beaumont to the Deputy Chief Electoral Officer. And it says the following. After interactions with Kosi today, we have come to understand that the reason nothing features in the acronym block of the ballot paper for Action SA is our registration documentation. It, in the attached Annex 2 form, part of our registration submission, we recorded that there is no abbreviation in the party name. Our expectation at that point would be that Action SA would feature as both name and acronym, which is why we chose a name that fitted with the eight character letter limit. Given that ballot sign-offs were taking place yesterday at municipal level, I would have to believe it is possible for the issue to be addressed. I cannot locate any section of the law or regulation that would be used to prevent <laughs> And I am sure we can all appreciate how the absence of an important identifying characteristic is important. The response from the Commission's official is at page 39 of the record. And the response, as you will see, is a considered one. In numbered paragraphs, Mr. Shiburi explains first the purposes of annexures one and two, as requiring a party to make a choice. Then refers to Regulation 8C of the Regulations for the Registration of Political Parties. 
to explain further the purpose of the annexures. He advises Mr. Beaumont of what in his view is the proper process to change an identifier, and that is to apply under section 16A. He then says, for all of those reasons, he says in the circumstances, the electoral commission is constrained from giving effect to your request. But that's not all he says. He goes on to conclude that even if it were notionally possible to accommodate the request, the printing of the ballots has already commenced. Action SA responded immediately uh, to disagree with this interpretation of the law by the commission. And this response is contained on paragraph 40 of the record. Uh, pardon me, page 40 of the record. And it is a detailed response from Mr. Michael Beaumont. He says, firstly, that section 8C of the regulation is not applicable because it addresses the protection of party identifying elements presumably from other parties who may register similar identifying elements. This section does not explicitly address the issue of ballot paper design, the inclusion or exclusion of identifying party characteristics, or any link between Annexure 1 and 2 and the ballot paper. The Act, he says, is silent on these matters. For example, and this is important, the photographs of party leader, leaders that, fe that feature on the national ballots are not required in the registration process, yet they appear on the ballot paper. This serves to demonstrate that the purpose of Section 8C is not about ballot papers. He goes on to say that the process of issuing draft ballots for parties to sign is rendered meaningless if issues are detected objections are lodged, and yet you allege that these matters cannot be remedied. He then says, again, explains again, with regard to Annexure 2 and the, the choice um, to select an abbreviation, he says, this is understood to mean that Action SA must be presented as such, whether referred to in full or in abbreviation. In this regard, the name of the party was purposely chosen to be within the character limit, eight characters of the abbreviation. No reasonable person could deduce from this that a party would willingly forego one of three or four identifying characteristics on the ballot paper. The implication of this is that Action SA was to be presented as Action SA. Whether abbreviated or not, it has only one identifier. At no point did Action SA accept that our name not being abbreviated would mean that we would be absent in one of the three identifying elements of the ballot paper. The apparent unwillingness of the Commission to remedy this issue is in conflict with its obligation to run free and fair elections. He then talks about the irreparable prejudice that Action SA will suffer by not being represented on the ballot paper. He requests that uh, the Commission, on the basis of this letter, reconsiders its position. The response... Yeah, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hassan, your 10 minutes protection is up. Mm -hmm. uh, le let me uh, re-emphasize what I started, uh, what I said earlier at the beginning of the proceedings. Uh, you know, without wanting to uh, take you out of line with your line of presenting the case. I think I, I wish to re-emphasize that uh, the papers we have read thoroughly and your heads. Uh, you may wish to emphasize one or two points, but I just want to reassure you that we are well off a with the content of the papers. I mean, uh, you, 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 you've, you've already spent some time, you know, on page 40, and you know, you are actually teaching us paragraph by paragraph of the letter. I just want to repeat that, you know, as you move along, just keep in mind that, you know, we have gone through these papers. You've, we've been provided with an index paginated bundle. Even before that, we were, we were provided with the, head, with, with, the, with the actual pleadings. You can be assured we've gone through. You don't have to 
go through every line and sentence of the of what is in the in the in the in the in the in the bundles. Thank you, Justice Mba. I will not be doing that for most of my argument. The reason that I ch ch chose to spend time on this aspect of the record is to deal with the argument that no decision was taken. Yes. To uh, what, 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 whilst you are there, what, whilst you are there, I just want to ask this. If, and I want to emphasize if, uh, you can be assured there's no predetermined approach here by any of the members of the bench. At least you can be assured of that. If What would be the implication, if at all, it was found that there was no decision? Well, taken? Because uh, that would mean there's nothing to review, not so. Well, uh, Justice Mba, that's not quite correct because what still remains... No, no, I'm asking, I'm asking, I'm asking. What's, yeah, what's the implication? Is the design of the ballot paper. Yes. And the design of the ballot paper, the exercise of the Commission's power to design the ballot paper is lawful or not. That would still... Yes. That will still be okay, fine, thanks. You may you may proceed. Thank you, Justice Mba. I won't then uh, labour uh, the point of this exchange that took place. It's important because... What it demonstrates is the features of the process that are consistent with the way the courts have approached the definition of a decision. So in summary, what we are saying about the feature of the process is firstly, that there was an objection noted by Action SA, which was explained with reference to the significance of its name. There was a request for the commission to remedy the problem of the ballot. The commission responded in detail with reference to facts and the law, the, that response culminated in a refusal to com accommodate the request. There was a further request for reconsideration. That was followed by a terse refusal. And then finally, the statement by the commission, which supported the approach, the decision by Mr. Shiburi. We submit that it is plain that the commission took a decision. It's a bad decision because the commission chose not to deal with the merits of the request. They did not accept that Action SA registration process in substance, if not in form, and failed to explain why an identifier that is presented as optional when you apply to register your party is later held to be mandatory in the view of the Commission. That is a decision, that, that it is a decision, is consistent with the judgments of this court. This court has reviewed and set aside decisions of the commission in cases where the decision was very much of a technical or clerical nature and that appears to be predetermined by a rule, such as the refusal to accept documents after the regulated deadline. We referred in our heads to the case of National People's Party versus the election. And uh, the relevant paragraph in that, uh, in that judgment is paragraph 16, which the court said that the contention that this application does not deal with the decision of the respondent because it did not take a decision is incorrect. The respondent responded to the applicant's application and the nature of his response is to support the actions of its officials to refuse to accept the documents tendered by the applicant on the basis that it was too late. Now, the Commission tries to distinguish this case by stating that in National People's Party, the objection was that the decision was not one taken by the Commission for the purpose of Section 21A of the Act. But that really doesn't take things any further for them. The bottom line is that the court held that the decision of the official to, accept, to not accept documents that was out of time and therefore did not meet the prescribed requirements was supported, that decision was supported by the Commission, and it was a decision that was reviewable by the Electoral Court. It took the decision, even though the time require, requirements of the Act were clear and peremptory. Uh, well, while I'm on may, may, may I interrupt you? Yes, Justice Jong. I just want to get clarity. When was the decision taken? the date, when was it taken according to the applicant? Uh, Justice Shongwe, the 
I think what we would say is that the decision culminated and was finalized at the point at which the commission issued a statement. That was on 4 October 2021. 4 October. That's um, correct. On, on that day, on the 4th of October, according to the papers, the, 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 the commission informed the applicant what they think of the request. The decision to design the ballot paper was taken before that. Am I correct? That is correct. Yeah, so the decision was not taken on the 4th. If it is a decision, it must have been made before because the commission is empowered to determine the ballot paper. So the exclusion of the applicant's name took, uh, uh, occurred before the complaint was made. A am I on the right track? Uh, Justice Shogwe, we, we don't agree with that because we say that the request that was made by Action SA must be determined with reference to the, to the reason for the objection by the commission. That, that was why I took you through those emails and through the responses, which yes. was to say, the reason you're not here is because you didn't register the name on the ballot paper. The ballot yeah. paper does, sorry, register the name on the registration form. Yeah. The registration form provides no link to the ballot paper and what will be on the ballot paper regarding an abbreviation. So for the commission to say, well, this is based on an earlier decision we took that is unlawful as we will show, is not an answer. Yes, because but, but you, you, you agree that the decision must have been taken before the 4th of October. Do you agree to that? I agree that the decision, the, ter the determination of the design of the ballot paper took place before the 4th of October. That's correct. Which is the decision that you are saying is unlawful. And we are saying that that decision is unlawful. But so, we are also saying, pardon me, I interrupted Justice Shaw. Okay, so the decision was not, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. The decision was not taken on the 4th. It was taken before the 4th. That's what I want to establish. No, Justice Shaw, so we attack both the determination of the design of the ballot paper, and we attack the decision by the commission not to remedy the problem for Action SA because it didn't fill out the form correctly. I see. So do I understand you correctly as the applicant that you are not attacking the constitutionality of Section 23? You are, you are not attacking that? The constitution. Okay. We okay. are not attacking the constitutionality of Section 23 of the Municipal Electoral Act. That provision is merely says that the Electoral Commission must determine the design of the ballot paper. What we are attacking is the exercise of the Commission's power under Section 23. Okay, I'm clear now. Thank you, Justice Shongwe. Um, I, I was um, dealing with National People's Party to show uh, the nature of the decisions that this court has reviewed and set aside. Uh, in the uh, heads of argument and in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat it, but we have referred uh, in paragraph 19 of our heads to the come decision by the Constitutional Court, which talks about the jurisdiction of the Electoral Court and the wide ambit of the jurisdiction of the Electoral Court to determine any decision, uh, um, in fact, each and every decision um, that is of an electoral nature. Uh, let me turn then to, well, let me just finalize this point. The attempt by the commission to non-suit the applicant by denying it took a decision in relation to this question of section 15 of the act and the registration form must fail. I'll turn now to the merits of the matter. The first is that the act and the regulations do not require an abbreviation. Section 15 of the Act 
says that the chief electoral officer shall, upon application of a party in the prescribed form in this chapter, register the party. 15.2, and it's 15.2c that's really important, but the whole of 15.2 says the form shall, inter alia, make provision for the following. A, the name of the party, B, the distinguishing mark or symbol of the party in color, and C, the abbreviation, if any, of the name of the party consisting of not more than eight letters. Annex show one is attached to the regulations. And if the court were to have regard to Annex show one, what it says is that under item one, it says name of party. Under item two, it says abbreviated name, if any, of the party. And in brackets, it says the abbreviated name may not consist of more than eight letters. It also says that it requires an A5 size logo for ballot paper printing pr purposes that must be submitted together with this application. So the form contemplates that a logo must be provided for the ballot paper printing processes, but does not ask the same for an abbreviation. In Annex 2, which is the notice that is uh, that lies open for public scrutiny, item three says the following, the abbreviation of the name of the party is dot, 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 and below that it says there is no abbreviation of the name of the party, and in brackets, <laughs> delete that which is not applicable. So what happened is that Action SA did not select an abbreviated name because in its mind, it wasn't required to do so. And Action SA serves a function and the, uh, of a name, an abbreviation, an acronym, however you wish to call it. Uh, and it fits the purposes, it meets the requirements of an abbreviation. Given that there was no requirement in the act or in, these, uh, or in the regulations, the most obvious place for the commission to notify applicants of the potential consequences of not ticking the box, not filling in the box for an abbreviated name, the obvious place is on the application form. The application form contains no information whatsoever to indicate that the choice to not register an abbreviated name is at the peril uh, of the applicant, because that is what the commission would depict on a ward ballot paper together with its logo. It is the duty of the Commission to warn applicants that absent a registered abbreviated name, only the logo would appear on the ballot paper. It doesn't do so. In other words, if the Commission were to elevate the requirement of an abbreviation to a rule for the purposes of the ballot paper, this should have been explicit in the registration form. The Commission has failed to explain why it chooses not to alert parties at the point of registration of this consequence. Yet it has the temerity to say, action SA, you made your choice, you must live with it. And that takes me to the next point, to the next topic, that the stance adopted by the commission is unreasonable and unconstitutional. Why do we say this? As I said, the commission's response is you didn't fill in that part of the form where it selects applicable or not applicable. It contends further that the only remedy for action SA is a change of identifier under section 16A of the Commission's Act. But this answer is unreasonable and it's a technical approach by the Commission. To require compliance with section 16A is to require technical compliance where there is substantive compliance with the purpose of the provision. Why do we say that? because it requires Action SA to effectively, effectively re-register its name, but this time by filling in the line that allows for an abbreviation. We have set out in our heads from paragraphs 46 why this is a mechanistic approach. I'm not going to repeat that. In short, the purpose for applying for an, an abbreviation under section 16A would be to follow the same steps that Action SA has already undertaken. And these steps that the Commission says that 
the, uh, either the applicant must take would take 30 days in order to meet the requirement that the name must be open for public scrutiny and objection. In its answering affidavit, the Commission is at pains to point out why this lengthy process is necessary. And that is at paragraph 67.1 of the answering affidavit, page 115 of the record. The Commission says, the importance of ensuring that the process of party registration is one that enables other political parties and the public in general to have an opportunity to raise objections is consequently a very important step, including to prevent new entrants from registering names, logos, and acronyms or abbreviated names that may be confusingly similar to others. This is something that with increased numbers beca becomes increasingly complex for the commission to manage. But the point is this, in this matter, that purpose, this important pur purpose that is set out in the answering affidavit has already been met. The name action as essay is already registered. It's passed the test of section 16 of the Commission Act. What Action SA was requesting the Commission to do is to recognize that it had met the purpose of the Act and to accept its explanation that the name serves as both a full name and an abbreviation and there is no acronym. There is therefore substantial compliance with Chapter 4 of the Act. By doing so, if the, the Commission were to accept that, it would not be acting contrary to any provision of the statute that governs it. Rather, it will be acting in a manner that best serves an assurance of free and fair elections. There's no prejudice to any other party because the purpose of the act is met. There's no scope for objection to the descriptor action essay on any grounds provided for in se section 16 of the act. To be reasonable, the Commission's decision must at the very least be capable, objectively capable, of furthering the purpose for which the power was given. The decision here does no such thing. It's formalism at its best. It therefore violates the requirement of rationality review under Section 62F2 of PAJA, even on the lowest standard of review. For the Commission to argue that Action SA is the author of its own misfortune when the registration form is ambiguous to say the least and misrepresents to say the worst and provides no warning with respect to that approach that the Action SA is the author of its own misfortune is cynical. It's also an approach that violates section 19 of the Constitution. Section 19 is implicated in two respects. First, that the statutory provisions of the Commission Act, including the annexures to the regulations, must be construed to promote the right. And second, the fact of exclusion of Action SA's name in the circumstances of this case means that the contestation does not take place on a level playing field, the contestation in the local government elections. Action SA is prejudiced and the requirement of free and fair elections is undermined. With regard to the first implication of section 19, and uh, Justice Mbar, I'm not going to read our section 19. This court is the, most court, the court that is most familiar with what section 19 contains. Uh, and with regard to the, the first requirement that the statute must be construed to consistent with section 19 is also well known to this court, and it stems from section 39, uh, two of the constitution which requires uh, that law must be interpreted to promote the liberality. Mr. Asim, if I could uh, interrupt and ask you this. Um, you've placed a lot of emphasis on the fact that uh, there was no warning given by the Commission on the Im implications of not having uh, an abbreviated name vis-a-vis -vis the the form, and that uh, you know the 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 commission it was incumbent upon it to have made that clear, you know the implications. Uh, the on the other hand, the explanation advanced is that 
Action SA should have been aware. Uh, there's a reference to a study, the MEB 13 on the papers that was done. And uh, the argument is that uh, Action SA should have been fully aware of the implications. What do you say about that? Thank you, Justice Zimba. That, that's quite important. Uh, first of all, we should look at that study, MEB um, 13, I think it is. And if you were to actually look at it, it doesn't provide any assistance to the Commission. Uh, my Lord, if I can just, uh, sorry, Justice Zimbabwe, if I can just find it. The, the, the HRC, HSRC report, first of all, looked at the design of national ballot papers. Yeah. Design of national ballot papers has a photograph of the leader of the party. It has the full name of the party. It has the acronym and it has a logo. It was not concerned at all with a design of a ballot paper that is only containing an abbreviation and a logo. And what is more, at page 55 of the record, one of the slides of the study says the following, some voters acknowledge that they do not even know what the DA, EFF or ANC stands for. Well, the reason why those participants of the study said is because those are old established parties with brand recognition. That is not the standard that should be applied. There should be a fair standard across the board that does not disadvantage new uh, uh, entrants to uh, contesting local government elections. But the study says the following. The focus groups did, however, agree that the party name, and they highlight this, the party name should be on the ballot and not just the acronym. So how could this have been a forewarning to Action SA that if you don't include your abbreviation on the registration form, you're not going to appear on the ballot paper? Uh, Justice Mba, I will return to, to some of this uh, in the course of the argument, but uh, I hope I've answered your question. Yes, you may proceed. Thank you. So I was dealing with section uh, 19 and what the prejudice is to, to uh, how, uh, what the prejudice is to Action SA. The absence of Action SA's name on the ballot paper impedes its ability Hello. to fairly contest the elections mm -hmm. on a level plane with other political parties. Again, I will no, stress in relation. Okay. Sorry. Are you coming in? Yeah. Anari? Anari, are you there? Yes, Judge. Uh, there are some people talking in the background. Uh, please, everybody, make sure that uh, the mics are muted. There's been a persistent disturbing <laughs> noise in, in the background. Please, everybody must uh, mute their mics. You may proceed, Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Justice Amir. The prejudice to action is a is that it will not be participating on a level playing field. And again, I was referring the court to the HSRC report and uh, the reference to the DA, the ANC, the EFF. Action SA was only registered on the 7th of December, 2020. It does not have brand recognition. It also impedes the rights of voters, therefore, to effectively exercise their choice when voting. This is because voters would not be able to discern whether and where Action SA is to be located on a ballot paper where only its logo is used. It must be borne in mind, and I'm stressing the obvious, it's a new political party. So it could be perceived by some voters as an absence of uh, Action SA altogether on the ballot. The court, the Constitutional Court in Cam, has held that the Constitution protects, and Section 19 protects not only the act of voting and the outcome of elections, but also the right to participate in elections uh, as a candidate to seek public office. And um, at paragraph 86 of CAM, if I may just, I'm not going to refer to everything in CAM, but just paragraph 86, if I may. 
because it's an important uh, point of emphasis in the judgment where Justice Wallace says, the constitutional requirement is that elections must be free and fair. This is a single requirement, not a conjunction of two separate and disparate elements. The expression highlights both the freedom to participate in the electoral process and the ability of political parties and candidates, both aligned and non-aligned, to compete with one another on relatively equal terms, so far as that can be achieved by the IEC. The narrow approach of the Commission excuse me, the name on the ballot has uh, the effect of severely action SA uh, in the gov local government elections because voters will be required to identify it only by its logo because it's a new party and voters may not recognize the logo. It will result in action SA being disadvantaged and older parties being advantaged. It is precisely that th this kind of disadvantage that Section 19 aims to prevent. The Commission spends time in its heads of argument to quibble with the standard of review that should be applied, but chooses to deny, boldly deny, that Section 19 is infringed at all and does not provide a basis for why an infringement in the circumstances is reasonable and justifiable. There's only one paragraph that captures the denial uh, uh, of, of Action Essay's claim that its right is infringed, and that's in paragraph 82.3 of the answering affidavit. It's a bold denial. The Commission has also been previously admonished to favour a construction of the Act that serves the purposes of Section 19 and Section 190 of the Constitution, but I'll, I'll deal with Section 190 in a moment. The court is referred to a series of cases in our heads of argument. They are cited at paragraph 65 of our heads of argument. I will only highlight the following. In the ACDP case, in the judgment by Justice O'Regan in the Constitutional Court, the issue was that relevant provisions of the Municipal Electoral Act, which required a deposit to be paid by a certain time and in a certain form, were not met. However, the court held that the legislative purpose had been met by the manner and form of payment by the ACDP. At paragraph 34 of that judgment, Justice Reagan says that in approaching the interpretation of provisions of electoral legislation, courts and the Electoral Commission must understand those provisions in the light of their legislative purpose within the overall electoral framework. That framework must be understood in the light of the important constitutional rights and values that are relevant. Well, what are the rights and values that are relevant? It's section 19 of the Constitution and it's section one of the Constitution, uh, which includes the value of a multi-party democracy. In that case, the Commission was required to take all necessary steps to include the ACDP in the municipal elections, which was to take place five days after the order of the court. I've already referred the, party to, uh, the, the, the court to the National People's Party case, where the court uh, found that although the adherence to the timetable is peremptory, it also found that the application of the time limits must be done in such a way that it facilitates participation instead of limiting participation. And it said that this is so because that is what is envisaged by the Constitution, Section 2 of the Municipal Electoral Act, and the values upon which the Act is based. In the Lotter case, much the same reasoning. The requirements of the Act were not met, but the Court found that although compliance uh, by the applicant was not strictly what it ought to have been, the injunction uh, has nevertheless been complied with, that is the purpose and the object of the Act, uh, had nevertheless been complied with. Here too, the substance of the Act, the purpose of the Act has been complied with. Action SA registered a name that is not more than eight letters long. That's what it chooses to do. In the hashtag era, a political party does not, to have, does not need to have a lengthy name with four words in it and acronyms. It chose Action SA designed very peculiarly. 
It meets the definition of the abbreviation as stated in the Act. The Act does not require the registration of an abbreviation, and there is no prejudice to any other political party or the public because the name has already passed the test for registration under Section 16 of the Act. The next topic is got to do with the constitutional duty that rests on the Commission, and this is important. It's important not just because the Constitution demands it, because the Constitutional Court and this Court has held that that duty must influence the way courts uh, assess uh, uh, and adjudicate cases uh, between applicants and the Commission. That duty is entwined with Section 19. The Court is familiar with the duty. Uh, I, again, I won't repeat what we have said in our heads of argument, and I won't repeat the duty, but what the Court said in calm is important and requires emphasis. The Court said, that this court must give full weight to the constitutional commitment to free and fair elections and the safeguard it provides of the right and ability of all who wish to offer themselves for election to public office. It is essential to hold the IEC to the high standards that its constitutional duties impose on it. The constitutional duties, of course, are also contained in, in sections of the um, uh, the Electoral Commission Act, particularly Section 4 and Section 5. In New National Party, the Constitutional Court had occasion to emphasize this again, the crucial importance in the context of our founding values, the crucial importance of the role that rests on the Commission. And in New National Party, the relevant paragraph is, is um, paragraph 12. The court said the following, the right to vote of course, is of course empty. Uh, sorry, the right to vote, of course, is indispensable and empty without the right to free and fair elections. The latter gives content to the meaning of the former. The right to free and fair elections underlines the important exercise of the right to vote and the requirement that every election should be fair has implications for the way in which the right to vote can be given more substantive content and legitimately uh, exercised. The reason that this high standard is, is um, demanded from the Commission is because of the importance in this country of electoral legitimacy and the integrity of the electoral process. On this score, we have referred the court again to cases where the commission was reminded by the court that, for example, errors in filling in forms by applicants who wish to contest elections on a fair basis with others, that those errors can be avoided if the commission upholds its duty to assist and take reasonable care when advising the applicants. Now, that's important because what the commission is saying in this case is you ought to have known. You are people who have been around, you ought to have known, but that is not sufficient. It's not good enough in this case, in the context of the requirement of electoral legitimacy and the duties in the commission to simply say, you ought to have known. The cases that we've referred to in our heads of argument uh, bear this out. To, to, to merely give the highlights uh, of some of the cases. In the Kaimar case, the dispute related to uh, the manner in which relevant forms were filled in and completed. Uh, the political party representative had filled in um, uh, only one form for both the district municipality elections and the local municipality elections. Um, he, he was not advised and did not understand that separate forms were required to be completed. The, the, the court held that the commission has a duty to assist political parties in the interest of strengthening uh, the country's multi-party democracy. And then it said as follows in paragraph 21, that exclusion could and should have been prevented if the officials of the commission took reasonable care when advising Mr. Jano. Such care and assistance was absent. The commission's response again is that Action SA should have known. And they correctly uh, 
as Justice Mba, as you pointed out, they say, you had the HSRC report, but I've taken the court to the HSRC report, and it doesn't stand for, for, for the proposition. It doesn't help the, the commission, uh, because in fact, the HSRC report that the full name of the party should be in the ballot paper. The commission also said that um, Action SA may be a young party, but it has members who are seasoned politicians. But that too doesn't assist the commission. First of all, it's not legitimate for the commission to look at different parties and look at their members and say, well, you are seasoned and you are not, you I can assist, you I don't need to assist. That's not how the commission's duties work. And it's not the seasoned politicians who fill out the forms, it's the staff of the party. They do so understanding that there's no abbreviation of Action SA's name. It's one name, it serves all purposes. So when they're faced with a form that says select which is applicable, it says not applicable. The fact that Mr. Beaumont uh, and Mr. Mashaba, uh, the leader of the party, are, are, are deemed to be by the commission seasoned politicians doesn't assist. They were politicians, they served in political roles under the Democratic Alliance, under the DA, a party with an established brand again, an established acronym. The importance of the abbreviation for the purposes of the registration form and a link to a ballot paper would not have occurred to them. They did not come to this court to say, they did not come to, they came to this court saying that it was only until they saw the ballot paper that they realized that, uh, that they appreciate the consequence of not separately registering its name as an abbreviation, even though it's the same name. So it's no answer for the commission to reprimand Action SA by saying you ought to have known, because as I've shown the cases say, that the response of a responsible commission is to be proactive and to assist parties who wish to exercise their right to participate in elections. And again, we have cited a catalogue of cases to support this proposition, that the duty is a proactive duty, not a duty that says, well, you must be imputed, it's imputed knowledge, you ought to have known. And an important judgment that stands for this proposition is the Johnson case uh, of this court, the Johnson judgment. And the Johnson judgment firstly um, cited um, former Chief Justice Pius Langer, in New National Party, where he very eloquently described the commission as being more than supervisory. And he said in his words, in the words of Justice Langer, that the, the commission's duty relate to an active, involved, and detailed management obligation over a wide terrain. Those are the words of Justice Langer. The Johnson court then says, uh, uh, the Johnson Court then says in paragraph 31 that the, the judge says, I'm of the view that the learned Chief Justice conveyed the duties of the commission, um, that the duties of the commission, pardon me, do not end by mechanically implementing the letter of the law. It is not only to, to act as a verifying agent insofar as strict compliance with the legislation is concerned. Its duties include a duty to assist voters and candidates. Such assistance should not be limited to ensuring that participants, um, pardon me, such assistance, yes, should not be limited to ensuring that participants have sufficient knowledge of the electoral process. It should promote a culture of helpfulness to all involved in the elections. It should display Willingness, willingness to assist those members of the public who wish to participate in elections, such assistance not being restricted to voters alone, but also to candidates. Again, the Johnson case had to do with incorrect filling out of the forms, and the court expressly stated that the commission's attitude that it was the fault of the parties uh, and not the commission uh, did not uh, hold water and that it was in conflict with the duty 
not to simply apply rules mechanically or technically, but to promote participation rather than exclusion. So with an appreciation of these duties in mind, we've invited the court to consider the approach adopted by the commission. The first, as I've repeated now many times, is that the commission says that Action SA is the author of its own misfortune because it chose not to have an abbreviation. But nowhere in the law, nowhere in the regulations, nowhere on the application forms does it provide that ballot papers may allow for abbreviations and thus those parties who choose not to have an abbreviation will only be identified by its own logo. So do so at your peril. That's not evident anywhere. The Commission itself did not advise Action SA at the time of registration of the implications. It was entirely reasonable of Action SA to choose to have a name only. As I said before, in the era of hashtag, the days of lengthy names with acronyms and several ways to identify yourself don't apply anymore. The Commission has deliberately chosen to design the ballot paper with reference to the party's abbreviation. It knows the implications of the registration process, yet it chooses not to advise applicants of the consequence. And what is the consequence? The consequence is that the party's name is not in the ballot paper. The right place to, to have alerted uh, Action SA and all applicants is on the, on the registration form. But Instead of it's but Ms. Hassan, if I could interrupt here. Um, the point is made that all parties were made aware, including, and Action SA was specifically aware of this, that for the identifiers, what would be used would be the information that was finished at registration. What do you say to that? There's nowhere on this in the record of this case, Justice Amba, that the Commission can point to having told Action SA and all political parties that those are the identifiers that will be used for the ballot paper. In fact, in fact, if you look at the national and the provincial ballot papers, it includes a photograph of the leader of the party. Yeah. When you register, you don't provide, you don't submit that to the commission. Yet the commission includes it on in the ballot paper, even though it was not there at the time of registration. So the argument doesn't hold water. Yeah. And Justice Mbar, and that is why we say that on this basis alone, what we've set out and what I've uh, hoped to convey to the court about the registration process, on that basis alone, it should succeed in this application. But the Commission attempts to deflect attention from the decision based on the registration form to the design of the ballot papers, what uh, Justice Shongwe asked, uh, asked me about earlier. So let me deal with that issue of the design of the ballot papers. Yes. Action SA doesn't contest that Section 23 of the Municipal Electoral Act empowers the Commission to design ballot paper. That's clear. The Commission says it should have challenged Section 23, but there's no reason to do so. There's nothing on the face of Section 23 that is unconstitutional. It merely gives the power to the Commission to design the ballot paper. So the problem is not with Section 23 itself. It's with the exercise of the power by the Commission in implementing Section 23, it acted outside the law by imposing a requirement that is contrary to the stipulated requirements for the registration of a political party. That power, the power under Section 23, we say, must be read together with the provisions of the Commission Act. And we've referred the court to the judgment of the Constitutional Court in Ruta versus Minister of Home Affairs. And in essence, what that judgment said is that it's a well-established that statutes, that that interpretive doctrine requires us to read statutes alongside each other so as to make sense of their provisions together. 
Uh, latest uh, statutes, general provisions don't derogate from another statutes related, another but related statutes, specific provisions. So similarly to Ruta, in this matter, the Commission seeks to invest the provision of the Municipal Electoral Act with the power to trump the provisions of the Electoral Commission Act. Because it is in 152C that stipulates what identifies a party is required to register, and it does not require an abbreviation. At paragraph 43 of the answering affidavit, uh, and that's at, at page 105, uh, the, the, the Commission says the following. It says that it exercised its powers in terms of Section 23 of the Municipal Act in compliance with the stipulated requirements and processes involved in the registration of political parties. And at paragraph 45, it says, when a political party applies to be registered, it knows that the information sought will be used in the design of the ballot paper. And they, sit, they say, look at clause 3B of Annex 1. Clause 3B of Annex 1 to the regulation says, A5 size logo for ballot paper printing processes must be submitted together with this application. It does not say anything about an abbreviation uh, or an acronym also being submitted together with the application. There's no requirement, therefore, uh, of an abbreviation in the statute. We've made that clear. And there's nothing on the application form that links it, the, uh, the abbreviation, to the design of the ballot paper. In the light of that, there cannot be a circumstance where the Commission would be permitted to design a ballot paper that effectively introduces the requirement for the registration of an abbreviated name, notwithstanding the specific requirements for registration in the, in, in the Commission Act. And it is to that extent that the Commission's exercise of its power under Section 23 is not authorized by law. Such exercise of power, as we well know, must be consistent uh, uh, with the law and with the empowering provisions. It, that exercise, if it's not, is inconsistent, therefore, with PAJA and the principle of legality. We've cited the cases on the principle of legality. We don't need to go through them. They're well known to the justices of this court. The principle is well established in our law and it's embodied in the Constitution. And it basically means that the legislature and the executive in every sphere are constrained by the principle that they may exercise no power and perform no function beyond that which is conferred upon them by law. We don't wish to, unless the court uh, wants me to go there, get into the difference between um, unlawfulness under PAJA and the principle of legality. The courts have also said that there's very little distinction to be held between uh, the two standards. The point is that the act and that the, um, the, the commission acted outside of uh, its powers because the Municipal Electoral Act does not authorize the commission to impose through the ballot paper the requirement of the requirement, any requirement, when it's not a requirement in the law, when it's not a requirement at registration under the Commission Act. Stated otherwise, the commission is not permitted to exclude from the ballot paper the name of a party that meets the definition of abbreviation in the act because it didn't register it as such. As we point out in our heads, there, there's effectively no difference on the standard of, of legality. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the case law, it's there in our heads. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the commission's um, determination to permit only registered abbreviations in contravention of Section 15.2c of the Commission Act and the regulations and Annex 1 is unlawful. They attempt to justify it by relying on a report, the same report by the HSRC, uh, which in their view shows that voters often identify parties by their logos and abbreviations. But I've taken the court now to the, the part of the HSRC report, uh, which shows that that in fact is not the case. I've also alerted to the court to the fact that the HSRC study was looking at the design of the national ballot paper. So 
when the Christian Commission uh, uh, exercises power under Section 23, it must do so in a manner consistent with the Constitution. It did not do so in this case. Can I interrupt you? Yes, Justice Romer. Uh, maybe I'm just jumping the, 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 the cut now. If we are with you on the aspect of the duties of the Commission, but is, is the, the relief that is requested uh, uh, practicable? Um, Justice Shongwe, I'm happy to answer that now, but I'm about to get there in about one minute. May I just conclude the point on Section okay. 20? That's why, that's why I said maybe I'm jumping the, the cut now. I, I'm not avoiding the question. I'll get there in approximately one minute. I will remind you. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, anx I'm anxious too to, <laughs> to get to that. I was about to try to prepare you to that, but my brother showed me was passed out on the draw than me. But I, I think finish your, your line of argument, then you can get there, Ms. Thank you, Justice I'm really almost about to conclude. Uh, I just wanted to, to deal with one other um, a challenge in the, in the commission you know, to the extent that it's there. But what I discerned the argument was that they were saying, they are saying is that when they uh, when oh, they, Ms. Sorry, Ms. Hassan, there's some interruption. I, I think it's coming from another device. Uh, you know what, let, let, let me see if I, try, if I mute my mic, if it will be better. Can, is this at all better, Justice Mbak? Can you, okay. Um, when the, what I understand them to be saying is that when the Commission exercises its powers under Section 23, it is implementing uh, legislation. That's what we say. But they're saying it's not. It's, it's, it's that they are making policy. And therefore, it should be insulated from judicial review. Now, this distinction of implementing legislation or making policy is quite important. And it was clarified by the Constitutional Court in Edu College case and Justice Mbao, we did not refer this to this case in our heads of argument. Uh, it's only something that we uh, were required to address after seeing the Commission's heads. So the, 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 the reference, if I may provide it, is yes. Permanent Secretary, Department of Education and Welfare, Eastern Cape. Yes. Ed versus Edu College. And it is to be found in the law reports at 2001, uh, volume two, SA, page one, and it's a decision of the Constitutional Court. And Justice O'Regan said uh, as follows, after dealing with the, the treatment of policy versus administrative action in the SAFU judgment, and, and this, is, this is what she said, it should be noted that the distinction drawn uh, in this passage, referring to SAFU, is between the implementation of legislation on the one hand and the formulation of policy on the other. Policy may be formulated by the executive outside of a legislative framework. For example, the executive may determine uh, a policy on road and rail transportation or on tertiary education. The formulation of such policy uh, involves a political decision and will generally not constitute administrative action. However, policy may also be formulated in a narrower sense, where a member of the executive is implementing legislation. The formulation of policy in the exercise of such powers may often constitute administrative action. And we are saying... Pardon my interruption, we have lost Ms. Parther. May we take just a second or two to get her back online, please? Okay, Henry.
Yeah, she, she has just sent me a note that uh, she's trying to reconnect on another server. I think let's just give her a, a moment. Yeah, I've just spoken to to Miss Partha. She's she will be with us shortly. She is. She says she has managed to reconnect to another server. So um, I apologize to everyone on the platform, but you know, technology it comes with all its hang-ups at times.
Uh, I think, uh, colleagues, Judge Mushiri, Judge Shong, I think what we should do, I see the time is, it's 10 to 11, because I was going to suggest we take a break at 11. Perhaps we should take our break now whilst uh, Ms. Partha is trying to reconnect. Uh, Ms. Hasim, how long I, do you think you're still going to be? Uh, Justice Shongwe, I'm now going to deal with the question of an effective remedy. Uh, and that's the last topic that I have to address. Oh, I okay. See, oh, I oh, all right. Ms. Partha, I think she's coming on board again. Okay, then let, let's finish you up. It's 10 to... You've been on your feet now since quarter past 11. Uh, but, you know, as I say, you know, I don't want to rush anybody. Uh, but let's, yeah, we'll let, yeah, yeah, I think we'll allow you to finish, then we'll take a break thereafter. Okay. Thank you, Justice Mbar. Are you, um, no, welcome. Are you back, Ms. Pata? Yes, thank you, Judge Mbar. Okay. All right, Ms. Hasim, sorry about that, about that interruption. Yes, let's proceed. Sorry, no, no, that's okay. That's all right. You may proceed, Ms. Hasim. That's please the court. Uh, uh, Justice Mbar, the question that was put to me uh, was the question of, of what is this court to do? Uh, once no, no, this before, before you, 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 you referred us to uh, that case of permanent secretary and you gave us the, the citation 2001, volume 2, SA, page 1. Uh, can you refer us to the specific paragraph? Um, uh, my Lord, um, Justice Mbar, can I ask one of my juniors to just locate it for me? I don't have it at hand at the moment. Oh, that's fine. I think I have yes, lost it on my, my computer, but I will yes. come back to the specific paragraph. And the point there was simply to say uh, that um, to the extent that it is doing so, the Commission should not be allowed to characterize the exercise of its power under Section 23 as policy, um, so as to insulate it from judicial scrutiny. Uh, yes. So to the, to the point of remedy then. We, of course, urge the court to find for Action SA because to do so is to vindicate its right under Section 19 and the requirement of free and fair elections. And it vindicates what the courts have, have, have made very clear is the duty of the Commission, which they failed in this case to comply with. Nowhere does the Commission deal squarely with the violation of the Section 19 right. I pointed out only one paragraph in the answering aff uh, affidavit, which is a bold denial. It doesn't attempt to explain why, if it is violated, why it is reasonable and justifiable. So they have nothing to say as we stand now to this court on that point. Once this court decides that the commission, uh, uh, commission's decision uh, to not include Action SA's name on the ballot paper is unconstitutional. It must provide a remedy. If it finds that it's ex the, the Commission's exercise of its power under Section 23 is unlawful, it must provide a remedy. Now, we are in the unenviable position of time constraints. Our, our attempt, uh, an Action SA's attempt to, to limit the problem of time uh, has failed, which is, which is the reason why um, we brought the application the 5th of October. Since then, time has passed. But that is not a reason why there should be no remedy provided for Action SA in this case. The remedy may not be perfect for these elections. The Constitutional Court in the recent cases of the postponement of the elections was mindful of that and said, well, do what can be done. Um, the Commission will have five years uh, to fix its ballot papers for the next election. But for the present, Action SA has approached this court for relief, and it should not be denied that relief on the basis uh, that there are, there's not enough time or that it is the only one who sought the relief. In our, um, answer, in our uh, reply, we attached a confirmatory affidavit. Initially, we, the request was a reprint of the ballot papers. The commission put up a barrier and said, no, it can't be done. This was at 5 October 2021. Mindful of the time remaining when we were about to appear before this court, we proposed two alternatives. One is for stickers to be printed 
as was the approach taken in 1994 elections with the late entry of the IFP, or for rubber stamps containing with self-containing ink uh, and bearing Action SA's name to be procured and distributed to the polling stations. Uh, in support of these proposals, we obtained an affidavit from Mr. Short of Shaven Gibson, uh, which is one of the printer suppliers that's been contracted by the Commission uh, for the printing of the ballot papers for the upcoming elections. Mr. Short advised that both the stickers and the rubber stamps, either one, would be achievable on a six-day lead time. And he gave an indication of the cost of, of doing so. Uh, in response to this, the Commission has posed a supplementary affidavit before this court after filing its head's argument, in, in which it questions whether this is indeed feasible, including whether Gibson itself has the capacity. But again, to our proposals, the Commission puts up blocks, it puts up barriers, it provides no other alternatives. Importantly, the Commission doesn't say that they have approached Shave and Gibson to determine whether they could assist the Commission, or any other company for that matter. The objection that procurement procedures would not allow for it rings hollow. Given the short time frame, emergency procurement procedures would accommodate the exigencies of, of, of the circumstances. And it cannot, if it, that cannot be done, there may be other options. But the Commission has not come to the sport to assist to find a practical solution uh, all it's done is, is put up these barriers. The reality of the time constraint, Justice and Bar, is, is, uh, um, is of the Commission's own making. It was open to change to the Commission to change the ballot paper design at the point when uh, uh, the, the, the objection was raised in early October. It appears to have done so if one has regard to the two ballot papers that are annexed in this record. Uh, the ballot paper that's put up by, by the applicant looks very different to the one that was then put up by the commission. So it appears to have changed the design of the ballot paper subsequent to uh, um, the date at which the applicant brought its complaint, but it did not do so to remedy the action, uh, the, the complaint of the, of, of the applicant, of Action SA. So, We've tried to present solutions. Those are the best solutions that we could come up with. We tried to get uh, input from the companies, uh, from Shave and Gibson, that is contracted to the Commission to provide assistance. Um, and, and we haven't heard anything from the Commission about how it can remedy this in the short space of time. So in the circumstances, uh, Justice Zimbabwe, we ask for the relief uh, that we set out in the amended notice of motion. And further, we say that this application would not have arisen if the Commission had applied its mind properly at the time when Action SA first approached it. And for that reason, the applicant also seeks costs, including the costs of two counsel. Justice Mba, those are my submissions. Uh, if, if, if I may ask, the option of um, if we are with you, the option of perhaps uh, uh, postponing the election in the ward in which Action SA is involved. Have you thought about that? What do you say about that? More so in the light of the ruling by the Constitutional Court that these elections have to be held by the 1st of November. Uh, th that's correct, um, uh, Justice Mba. We, we did consider the question of a postponement at the time when the case was launched. But at that time, we thought that there would still be a remedy that would fall short of the need for a postponement. Uh, yeah. However, if there is need for a postponement, uh, it's not, uh, um, if there is a need for a postponement to ensure the free and fair elections, what is important is that it's not the whole local government elections that are being postponed. It is the elections in certain wards. 
as come in the come decision, the constitutional court, sorry, dealt with in the come decision, uh, there it's permissible to to postpone certain ward elections on the grounds that it's free and fair. And if that is the only remedy that is left to Action SA in this case, because which is important because its rights were violated and an effective remedy must be provided. And if that is the only remedy, then that's the remedy that the court should order. But then, uh, you know, this leads me to the second problem that comes to mind, which is what happens to other political parties, other independent candidates contesting the same word, who are ready to proceed, who are quite content to proceed, and but who have not been joined. What do we do about those well, parties? First of all, on the question of joining the parties, Justice Sambar, let me say that it's not in Action SA's knowledge which political parties are affected. It's in the Commission's knowledge. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, no, no, that may be so, but I'm asking you specifically. If we were to consider that, if we are with you, I want to emphasize if we were with you, and because the question of the alternative uh, uh, um, uh, solutions uh, of the stickers and the rubber stamp, that is being disputed by the IEC, whether validly or not, that's something that we'll have to decide, but that is in dispute. Um, uh, my concern is if we were to consider that what, because I'm sure there must be other parties or candidates contesting, what do we say about them? What if well, tomorrow they rush and say, look, we are ready and we hear the election in the ward has to be postponed, we have not been joined and we are ready to, what, what do we do as a court? Uh, Justice and I, I, I can't speculate about what other parties will do, but what I can say is this, is that if there's a delay, uh, and I would imagine it would not need to be a lengthy delay, if there's a delay of a couple of weeks, there wouldn't be a prejudice to other political parties because it's a short delay. And the point of the delay is to ensure a level playing field. So the, if, if you replace the place the objections of other parties on one end of the scale and Action SA on the other end of the scale, then Action SA's case uh, must succeed because it involves the requirement of free and fair elections and, and, and the violation of the right. So uh, on the balance, on balance, I would say that a short delay would not prejudice other parties, but to run the elections without relief for Action SA would prejudice Action SA. Uh, Mr. Sim, I want to refer you to the ballot, which is uh, attached as PSM5, uh, which is the word, the word ballot. It's an extra PSM5 to the answering affidavit. Can you see it? Yes, I see it. Yeah. Uh, is this the current word ballot? That is correct. Yeah. Now, looking at this ballot. Excuse me, ballot, which page are you reading it now? It's, On the record? It's page 185. One, 185. All right, thank you. Have you got it, Justice Shulman? Yes, I've got it. 185. Yeah. Now, looking at this ballot, Ms. Hussain, uh, Action SA is number... Fifteen on this ballot. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Uh, the name of the candidate appears first, and in uh, in Action SA's case, it is Modibedi Dipalo. Am I right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And there is, of course, the logo 
and uh, the abbreviated name of Action SA, of course, does not appear, which is central to this appeal. My question to you is this. Mudibedi Dipalo, does the what candidate for Action SA, am I right? That's correct. Yes. Now, the argument made by the respondent is that in respect of what elections, the name and identity of the candidate is very important because, amongst others, the candidate in the what election is the one who will be doing the campaigning, visiting voters or potential voters door to door, and the name, their name will be very discernible to all people who would want to vote for the Action SA in that particular ward. Now, the argument, of course, being that on the ballot, the current ward ballot, the name is there, the logo is there, and that this should not disadvantage Action SA. What do you say to that? Mr. Zimbabwe, one needs to only look at this ballot paper to see the disadvantage. Yes. All of the acronyms are there. All of the abbreviations are there, barring Action SA. The fact that this is a ward election, uh, yes, does mean that the name of the ward candidate is quite important. But the ward candidate is not standing as an independent. He is a member of the political party. He has that a right... Is, uh, Yes, yes, Ms. Hassan. Uh, so the, the, yes. the thing, what I'm putting to you is the, the voters in that ward, the, the argument presented is that the voters in that ward uh, can never make a mistake of thinking that Mudibedi belongs to any other party. They know him. He's been to their houses. He's campaigned there. And not only that, the logo of the party is there. And the argument is that the name of the uh, candidate for the ward is there, is clearly discernible, no mistake, and the, and the logo is there. And the argument is that the ballot, the ward ballot as it stands should not um, uh, uh, disadvantage action as, as a SAA. The argument goes further to say, in fact, Action South Africa is the is not the only party whose name does not appear on the ballot. There are 13, 14 other parties who don't have abbreviated names, but they only have the names of the what candidates appearing in similar fashion. Uh, there is also the question of the the PR ballot. Now, which have also been distributed in relation to this uh, election. Now, on the PR ballot, the full name of Action SA appears. So, to sum up, on the white ballot, there's the name of the candidate and the logo. Other parties, there are similar other parties whose name, whose abbreviated names don't appear on the white ballot. And of course, the full name of Action SA does appear on the PR ballot. And the submission advanced is that all of this should not particularly uh, disadvantage Action SA. What is your response to that? Thank you, Justice Mba. First of all, if the political party's name was not important, then none of the political parties names should be included in the ballot paper. The reason it's there, even though it's a ward ballot, where the candidate's name is important, the reason it's there is because the commission has determined that it is important to have the name of the, the political party on the ward ballot. Once that is so, it's not good enough to say, well, it's really not necessary for Action SA, just having regard to this PSM5 award ballot. The PR ballot papers include the full name of Action SA. But what, what the argument is, is proposing 
is that when voters are voting, they must compare the different ballot papers to try to see what this logo stands for, the Action SA logo, bearing in mind that Action SA is a new party. On the face of it, the logo could be misconstrued as just merely the South African flag, and maybe Mr. Modibedi is an independent. That is a disadvantage to Action SA. Action SA has a right to be identified by its candidate and by the name of the party. So, so where the party's name is not present, it's not sufficient to say, well, but the logo is there. And it's not sufficient to say, because that logo is not enough to, uh, to, to ensure that there's clarity and certainty in the mind of the voter. And we are required to ensure that there's no confusion when it comes to the voting process. The second thing is to say that the logo can be interpreted with reference to the other ballot paper where Action SA's name is, con is, is included is, is really a step very far. Again, it's asking the voters to undertake an exercise that we have no reason to think that the voters will take. That is a disadvantage to Action SA. No other party, is, no, vote, no voter in relation to any other party is required to do that. And no other party is required to uh, assume that voters will have regard to a set of ballot papers in order to interpret the ward ballot paper. But for Action SA, uh, the, the argument goes, well, it is on the PR ballot paper, so it's fine if it's not here. And that simply cannot be correct. The commission determined that party identifiers on a ward ballot paper is important. Once you decide that, you must include all party identifiers for all parties, particularly in the case of new parties who require the assistance of the commission. It's fine for, the, for the, those established parties where the acronyms are known. They don't actually need to look at the logo. In fact, I'd be surprised if we ourselves in this, in this courtroom can identify all of the logos on this, on this page. Uh, certainly, it would be difficult for voters to recognize a new logo, such as that of Action SAs. That, 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 is, that is the best I can offer to you, Justice Simba. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Asim. Uh, colleagues, any questions from the bench for Ms. Hassim? Of course, you are going to have a right to reply after Mr. Bishop has addressed this. But any questions, Justice Shongwe? Uh, he's muted. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No, at the moment, I don't have a, a question. Uh, what I had in mind has now been clarified. Okay. Justice Mushiri? Justice yes. Mushiri? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I wanted to follow up on the question initially intended to be asked by Justice Shonga, but he abandoned it about the relief. Um, I just want to ask counsel for the applicant if on the ballot paper we refer to now, page. Um, Page 185, yes, of the paginated papers. And specifically under the column of uh, SA, um, action SA, counsel for the applicant has made heavy weather about the responsibility of the IEC to having credit to help to act independently, um, impartial. What comes to mind to me is if the IEC had put in under the, um, the short name of SA Action, um, which is blank there, I think it's common cause. Are we together? It's yes, only the logo. It's only the logo.
Are we together? Yes, Justice Mashidi, I'm following you. But if the, A the IEC on its own had taken the initiative to write in their essay action, would that have been fair to the other parties? On its own, the IEC on its own deciding that it, there is no abbreviated name. We're going to put in essay action there. Uh, would that have been right. would that have been fair to the absolutely. other parties involved absolutely. here? Absolutely, Justice Mashidi, because there's no prejudice to the other parties. Yeah. But it was not a duty of uh, the IC to do that, because no name, no abbreviated name was chosen by SA Action. It was certainly a duty of the Commission at the point when Action SA pointed out. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, what what its uh, what the basis of its complaint was, and that it complied in substance with the purpose of the act. And at that point in time, the IEC could have included it on the ballot paper and should have included it on the ballot paper. There's absolutely no prejudice to other parties. Yes. What Action SA is asking for is compliant with the law, in other words, because it makes okay. I understand you. Thank you, Judge Mba. Ms. Partha? Um, yes, I just needed to know one thing, please, Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Justice Ba. Uh, your discussion in relation to the identifiers in response to Justice Mba's questions, uh, when you said, uh, Ms. Hassan, that a voter would go, voters would go in and look for the, for the name of the party. Is it presupposing that voters would not have made up their minds before they enter into the voting booth? Absolutely, Ms. Pather. I think that it is not uncommon for voters to change their mind at the last minute when they are faced with the ballot paper. Um, and, and, and we must anticipate that that will happen. But when you look at this paper and if the action is, and, and remember that these are local government elections, uh, although it's a ward ballot paper, there are new parties. This is a multi-party democracy. There are new parties entering the fray. There are new parties entering the fray. I'm sorry to belabor it, but the, the, the Constitutional Court also dealt with this in the postponement case uh, about the importance of particularly these local government elections uh, in the context of the Auditor General's findings against so many municipalities. I don't have the reference at hand, but I know it's in that judgment. Um, so. So the importance is not just the candidate, it's the party that's entering the fray to contest this. And there's, there's, I mean, I don't want to give evidence from the bar about, um, uh, about studies and, and, and surveys about what, how undecided voters are, but uh, there's a lot of discussion about how undecided voters are at this okay. point in time. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Justice Bond. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, Ms. Asim, just before I let you go, one last question, which is just, you know, there are so many issues in this, in this matter. If we are with you, and uh, if we are with you, uh, we have to set aside to the ballots, am I right? As being unlawful. Am That's I right? Correct. That's right. Inclu including the PR ballot, which... Uh, uh, Reflects the full name of Action SA? No, no, not the PR ballot. It's only applicable to the ward ballots. And that is if the court were to find that the decision uh, by the IEP to design the ballot paper in that way is unlawful. It would only be applicable to the ward ballot paper. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Um, uh, colleagues, I see now the time you said. It's 20 past 11. Uh, we, were, we are going to take a, a, a 10 minute uh, uh, leg stretch. Um, we'll reconvene at uh, half past 11. Please don't leave the platform. Uh, just switch off your camera and mute. Ms. Bishop, Mr. Bishop uh, will entertain you after the tea break. Uh, as the court pleases, Justice Simbab. As the court we we are will reconvene at eleven thirty. Thank you.
No, I'm, I'm also using the, I'm at the Jovek High Court, but the, the light keeps on going off. You know, it needs some movement of some sort uh, to trigger something. <laughs> it's such, yep. so annoying. Oh, is it a sensor? Sensor yeah. operated. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, John is back. They are still backwards. Uh,
Okay, thank you, Anu. Okay. okay.
you for a second. Hello, everybody. Is everybody back yes, on the I platform? Uh, hello, I, I must. I, I must uh, uh, apologize. Uh, I, I'm sure you can imagine how stressed I am. I'm sure you must be feeling the same. Uh, Judge Shongwe lost connectivity massively. Uh, I've been talking to him. Uh, uh, he can't even connect, switch on onto his phone. He tried to even use his phone, but he just can't get through. So there is a technician from the Jobe Kai court who's already left to his house to try and go and see what's the problem. So uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, we take our lunch break now. Hopefully, uh, when we come back at two o'clock, I'm sure there will be something. If the problem uh, persists, um, we will just have to look at alternatives, how best we can finalize this matter. But I'm just hoping and crossing my, you know, I'm hoping that we will be able to continue at two o'clock. Uh, I've, 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 I've I've got a webinar, an international webinar, uh, starting at three o'clock on electoral justice for the global network on electoral justice of which I'm president. It's, it's set down for two days, tomorrow, today and tomorrow, because of the di time differences with Mexico, where the head office is, the South African time we're supposed to start at three o'clock and I had hoped by then I would be finished with this case to uh, start with it. But uh, I'll, I'll send them a message that, uh, you know, I, I won't be able to join. I was scheduled to speak today. Um, yeah, so let's hope we can resume at, 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 at two o'clock. Uh, I'm sorry, please accept my apology um, for this delay. So let's let's reconvene at two o'clock. Okay. Thank thank you, Judge uh, Mbao. I hope you all understand, Advocate Hasim. <laughs> I'm sorry, and Advocate Bishop. Uh, that's the position, unfortunately, for now. So we will reconvene at two o'clock. Hopefully, I'll have better news to say to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Please uh, don't leave the platform, just switch off the mics and the video camera. Thank you.
Thank you, Justice Mba. I, I should begin with an apology that I'm, I'm not Mr. Ngaitobi. Um, I, yes. I, I, I'll do my best to, to reproduce his, his brilliance. Um, as, as a result, I'm also not going to stick strictly to the uh, argument and structure in the heads. I've got a slightly different approach to it that I'm going to follow, but obviously covering all the relevant issues. If I can begin, Justices, just to give an outline of what I want to say. So I'm going to begin with just an overview of the case, a big picture overview, then deal with what we call the first challenge, which is the applicant's attack on the supposed decision not to put its name on the ballot paper. I'm then going to deal with the second challenge, which is raised in reply and in the amended notice of motion uh, to the ballot decision itself attacking the design of the ballot. And that, that really, I think, the, the heart of the case is, is there. Fourth, I'm going to deal with the timing of the challenge, because the Commission submits that this court shouldn't consider the challenge at this stage, and that it's more appropriate for the applicant to bring a challenge after the elections if it thinks that it is not free and fair. I'll deal next with the issue of remedy, uh, if the court is against us and finds that the Commission has acted unlawfully in, in some way, what the available remedies are uh, for the applicant. And finally, and very briefly, on the question of costs. So to begin with the, the overview, we submit that the applicant effectively has brought two cases. The, the first case, which is the one that's made out in the founding affidavit, is an attack on the Commission's decision to exclude its name from the Ward Council ballot. And the Commission's answer to that case is, is a very simple one. It took no such decision. What it did is merely implement or applied an earlier decision it had taken about how to design the ballot, a decision it took under Section 23 of the Electoral Commissions Act. So the, the Municipal Structures Act, the Municipal Electoral Act. So, so we submit that that's a, a very simple answer to the, the case, the way it was initially brought by the applicant. But having received the answering papers, the applicant shifts tack. And it then says, no, actually, what we're really challenging is the way in which you've chosen to design the ballot. And so that, that's a new case that was made out in reply and in the amended notice of motion. And the, the commission isn't taking a point about a new case in reply. We're not objecting to it. We'll, we'll deal with it on the merits. Um, but just to point out that that's how the case developed. And we say, the, the second case, the attack on the design of the ballots, must fail for the simple reason that the Commission's decision of how to design the ballots was entirely lawful and constitutional. Because it's entirely reasonable to use only abbreviations for ward ballots. And the reason is, is a very simple one. The ballots must be 21 centimetres wide. They cannot be any wider. The ward candidate ballot must include the ward candidate's name. It cannot then also include the full name of political parties. It can only fit the abbreviation. That's why the PR ballot has both the full name and the abbreviation, whereas the ward candidate ballot only has the abbreviation. And so that's a perfectly rational decision. In fact, the applicant even accepts that it's rational to limit uh, abbreviation, to use abbreviations for any party whose full name is longer than eight letters. What is really at the heart of this case is that the applicant seeks differential treatment from the Commission. So it accepts that the Commission was entitled to use only abbreviated names for most parties. And, and it must be so because the full names would not fit. But what it argues is that because its name is only, its full name is only eight letters long, it should be treated differently than any other party. And its full name should be treated as its registered abbreviated name. An applicant says it should be treated differently because it is a new party and voters may not be aware of its logo because it is a new party that was registered in 2019. But the Commission cannot have different rules for old parties and different rules for new parties. It must have the same rules for all parties. Otherwise, the election will not be free and fair. And here, the same rule has been applied to all parties equally. The rule is we will put your registered abbreviated name on the ballot. And if you choose not to have a registered abbreviated name, that is your choice and we will respect it. But the second reason it says it should be treated differently is because, well, it chose its name, Action SA, 
to be only eight letters long. And so therefore the commission should intuit that it wanted its name to be its abbreviated name. But there was nothing stopping the applicant from registering Action SA as its abbreviated name. When it initially applied for registration, it put Action SA as its abbreviated name. Other parties like the Good Party have registered Good as its full name and its abbreviated name. And the commission has respected that choice. You will look at the, the ballots and you'll see that Good appears both as the full name and the abbreviation because that's what it registered. And there's nothing unusual about what's happened here. This is what the commission has been doing since 1994. It uses abbreviations on ballot papers. It relies on parties registered identifiers that they register through the formal process in the legislation. And the issue hasn't come up before. Nobody has complained about it because parties knew if you don't register an abbreviation, the commission can't use an abbreviation. And, and uh, this is a very important point, Justices, that it's vital for the commission to use only registered names and registered abbreviations because those are the only ones that have gone through the legislative process to check that there are no conflicts with other names that won't cause confusion for voters. It cannot use, it would create great uncertainty, great risk of confusion and unfairness if the commission were to use any name other than a registered name and a registered abbreviation. But that is exactly what the applicant is asking the commission to do. It's asking the commission to use an unregistered abbreviation that has not gone through the legislative process and to put it on a ballot because it failed to register an abbreviation when it registered the party. Now, <laughs> the, the applicant tries to frame the case as one of substantive justice or substantive participation versus the formal or technical approach of the commission. But this misunderstands the nature of free and fair elections. Both this court and the constitutional court have repeatedly recognized that the implementation of the, the strict implementation of rules promotes free and fair elections. <clears throat> because it's exactly when you give the commission the power to exercise discretionary judgment in whether to accept late applications, whether to change names on a ballot, that you create the risk that the commission will be seen as biased and partial because every time it exercises discretion for or against a party, it will be seen correctly or not as taking sides. And so to, in order to protect the freeness and fairness of the election, and in order to protect the impartiality of the commission, it needs to be immunized from taking those types of decisions by setting the rules clearly and fairly beforehand, and then strictly implementing those rules. And so this is what the, the Constitutional Court said in the Electoral Commission versus Encarta Freedom Party case. I'm quoting from paragraph 55. Even handedness in dealing with all political parties and candidates is crucial to the integrity of elections and its perception by voters. The commission must not be placed in a situation where it has to make ad hoc decisions about political parties and candidates. And so it is entirely fair to have a, a neutral rule that only registered abbreviations will appear. And then to apply that rule when Action SA and every other party was entirely free to register whatever abbreviation they wished to register. So we submit that at the end of the day, this case turns on whether the applicant should be held to its own freely taken choices or if the commission should be required to interfere with those choices and the choices of other parties. Or put differently, we submit the question is this, is it unlawful to apply reasonable neutral rules for the design of a ballot just because the application of those rules will have a negative impact on one party as a result of that party's choices? And we submit the answer is no and the application should be dismissed on the merits for that reason. If I can then, uh, so, so we, we, on the issue of remedy, the applicants, just to give the overview again, the applicants case has again shifted. So initially the, the relief sought was to compel the commission to reprint the ballot papers. 
And the commission explained in its answering affidavit why it was not in a position to do that. In reply and in the amended notice of motion, the applicant shifts its relief. It now asks for stickers or stamps. But again, the commission shows that this is not feasible and not possible. And I'll get to it again in more detail. But the, the reality, and it may be an unfortunate reality, is that given where we are, that the elections must take place on the 1st of November. They cannot be postponed one day beyond the 1st of November. And, and I'll get to the Constitutional Court's decision on that, but that's the Commission's position. Not for one ward or one municipality, they cannot be delayed. <clears throat> that it may be that even if the applicant is correct, it does not at this stage have a remedy that will get its abbreviation on the ballot. And we submit for that reason, it may well be more appropriate for this court to say it's not going to determine the application and it should instead be determined through an ex post facto after the election. If the uh, applicant can show that the exclusion of its abbreviation rendered the election unfree and unfair, then the, the relevant elections can be reheld. And the provisions exist for that in the Municipal Electoral Act, that by-elections will be held in the relevant wards and municipalities if necessary. And that is, for better or worse, the only way that the applicant could obtain relief at this stage. So, Justice, I didn't like that. That that's, completes my overview of the Commission's case or summary of the case. <clears throat> if I can then turn to what we call the, the primary challenge, which is what the applicant initially came to this court seeking. And this is to, uh, it's in part two of the original notice of motion. <clears throat> It's asked for declaring the commission's decision to exclude on the 2021 ward ballot paper for the elections to be held on 1 November, the name of the applicant and failing to uphold the applicant's objection to the exclusion uh, of its name is unconstitutional and unlawful. And, and as I've mentioned, the, the commission's answer is quite simple. There was no such decision. The decision was the earlier one about how it would design the ballot, and then it applied that decision application of a decision, implementation of a decision, is not a decision itself. So th there was a policy decision taken about how the ballot would be structured. And then there was a clerical act of implementing it. So obviously some officials within the commission took the policy decision, this is how the ballot will look, went through all the registered, in registered information of the various parties who are competing the elections, and filled in the ballot accordingly. But no decision was taken by those officials who were implementing the decision. And, and so there's no separate decision to challenge. And, and we submit, I listened very carefully to my learned friend, Mr. Sassim, and we submit the applicant has no answer to this point. It, it, it asserts that the commission takes a decision, but there's no basis for it to contradict the commission's own version, which is that it never took a separate decision. It, it, it repeatedly said to Action SA, we can't put you on the ballot because you haven't registered an abbreviated name. And it kept giving it the same answer again and again. Just because it was giving it the same answer doesn't mean it was taking new decisions. It was just repeating the position. And, and it couldn't be otherwise because what Action SA is suggesting is that the Commission should have a power to say even though your abbreviated name shouldn't be on the ballot paper given the neutral predetermined rules. An exception should be made for Action SA. But there's no basis in the statute for that, and it would, for the reasons I've already given, undermine the freeness and fairness of the elections and threaten the impartiality of the Commission. Mr. Bishop, uh, I, I must interrupt at this stage just to warn you that your 10 minutes grace has long come and gone. Yes. So don't I, be surprised if you start interjection. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Justice Mbal. Uh, my learned friend then referred to the, the facts but uh, and, and seemed to suggest that that showed that there was a decision taken. But we submit that the facts don't help the applicant. If, if I can take your lordships briefly to page 41 of the record. I'm not going to go through all the correspondence, but I do just want to refer to this one. Because I think the uh, the last piece of correspondence from the Commission, uh, it's from uh, Mr. Shaburi, the Deputy CEO. And he says, I confirm that Action SA has not registered an abbreviated name. This is the reason it does not have any on the ballot paper. 
ballot paper sign-off is not intended to remedy de And that's the, the sorry, just Mr. Bishop, we, we, we lost you momentarily. Um, oh, I, I apologize. Can you I, I was just reading the 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 email on page 41. Yeah. And just to make the point that that's the same position the commission adopts now, which is not that you there was a separate decision taken with regard to Action SA, but that we implemented the decision. Uh, whether that we implemented we took what you registered when you registered your party. We took our decision about the how to design the ballot. We put the two together and this was the result. So my learned friend said, well, you know, what about the photographs? The photographs are, are treated differently. Um, but obviously photographs are, are different because a different person competes in each election. The registration of a political party is, is set unless it's changed by the political party. Whereas obviously who competes changes from election cycle to election cycle. So the photographs have to be provided each election. But unless you go through the section 16A process, the other identifiers remain constant across elections. So the, the reference to photographs doesn't take the matter anywhere. Uh, it's also- Sorry, my, my may, I may I interrupt, sorry? Yes, yes, Peter um, You're talking about photos. Are those the photos on page 41 at the bottom still or other photos? No, so, so these are the, the, the photos for the, the people who are competing in elections, oh, uh, which not don't, here. don't, not, not these photos, no, uh, oh, yeah. Justice Mashidi. Okay, thank you. But, but Ms. Hasim had said that photos are treated differently because the commission asks for the photos for a particular election. Yeah. Um, but that, that is different from the identifier, Thank which you. is the registration. So, so, so no new decision was taken by the commission. It just repeats the consequences of its original decision. So we submit for that reason alone, the uh, challenges originally framed should fail. But, but even if there was a decision, the substantive answer to the decision, to, to the first challenge, to the supposed decision to exclude action essay, is the same as the substantive answer to the second challenge, which is the attack on the ballot design itself. And so I'm now going to move to, to that, to dealing with what, what really is, is the applicant's core complaint, was an, which is an attack on the ballot design. So, so this case is, is made just out before, in, Just in, before you continue, just yes. before, yeah, before you continue, uh, did I hear you correctly to say that uh, the commission has made rules uh, that only registered abbreviation will be considered. Now, where are those rules? Justice Shongwe, that's the decision in the ballot design. So, so it may be it may be inaccurate to call them rules, but no. that's when it designs the ballot. It says this is how we're going to do it. We're going to have these columns, and this mm -hmm. is what's going to go in each column. And what its decision has been, and I don't think there's any debate about that this is in fact the Commission's decision, which is that it will populate those columns with the information drawn from the registered doc from the party's registration. Okay. So whether that's the full name, the logo, or the abbreviated name. Yeah, but the, the political parties, were they informed that in the design of the ballot paper, uh, 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 explain the importance of the abbreviation that it will be applicable in the design and not the name. Because what we all know, what is important is the name of the party should be on the ballot paper. Now, in the event uh, the name is not there and the, uh, an abbreviation will be will be used, were the parties informed about that? Justice Shango, we say yes that any reasonable political party would know that was the case. OK, and that actually, well, you are saying any reasonable, but were they informed? J Justice Shungwe, I, I can't point to a specific document which set that out in black and white and was sent to all political parties. So that how, will, how, will, how will Action SA know that uh, even though the act says you may register a, a, an abbreviation, but it is a requirement 
in 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 designing the 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 ballot mm. because but, according to the act and regulations it's not a, a requirement to have an abbreviation but the the ballot paper is designed in such a way that the abbreviation is a requirement just to show I, 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 the commission doesn't accept that it's a requirement because action SA remains on the ballot. It's not a requirement to be on the ballot that you have an abbreviated name. It's not a requirement to compete in elections to have an abbreviated name. Yeah, it, the, the, you see, the, the ballot requires a, 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 an abbreviation because if you don't have, if you don't have, your name does not appear on the ward ballot paper. No, Justice Strongway. You, the, the, the candidate for action SA is on the ward ballot paper. It's logo is on the ward ballot paper. What is not there is it's abbreviated name because it chose not to register an abbreviated name. So we, it, it's not like the commissioner said, if you don't have an abbreviated name, we won't put you on the ballot paper. That's in not other, what has happened here. In other words, it says so, in other words, because it makes it a requirement. No, but because it, it's not a requirement. The, the spot can be left blank. But mm -hmm. if, if, if the political party chooses not to register an abbreviated name, then when the ballot is designed, in the column where will, the abbreviation will appear, there will be a blank. That's what's on the sample ballot papers that have been provided. So it's not a requirement. To call it a requirement is inaccurate. Well, what it is, Justice Shongwe, is, is this, is that there are consequences for political choices by political parties about how they register their party. Absolutely, there are consequences for that. My, and this is one of those consequences. My question remains, were they informed that they are, there will be consequences? And then you say there is no paper where they inform the, the parties. How were they supposed to know that, the consequences? Justice Shongwe, firstly, we think that's the wrong question. It, it's, there's no duty, uh, and there's no duty that the applicants have pointed to. And I'll take you, you Justice Shongwe, to the case law on this. There is no duty on the commission to have informed the political parties about this expressly. That okay. Nowhere can the applicant say, here in the statute is this obligation. And we say in any event, any reasonable political party competing in elections will consider what does a ballot paper look like when it's registering its name, when it's registering as a political party, it's choosing its logo. It should know, it can be taken reasonably to know what previous ballot papers look like. And previous ballot papers have all had abbreviations on it. And if Action SA was unsure, the onus was not on the commission to hold Action SA's hand and tell it what political choices it should do when it's deciding how to register its name. The onus was on Action SA to go to the commission and say, if we don't register an abbreviated name, if we put NA, what will that mean for us? And if the commission then had given false or misleading answer to Action SA, then it would have a case. And that's what Johnson and Kay Mara about. I'll, I'll take the, the court there later. But those cases are very, very, very different. What happens in both of those cases is that a candidate goes to the commission and says, the, the one problem is about having 50 names on the ballot. The other one is about registering candidates for a district municipality and whether you go to the district or the local. But they go to the commission, and they say, I have this problem. Please help me. And the commission says, yes, we'll help you. And then they give them inaccurate information or in Johnson, they never get back to them and they don't get back to them and help them check that the 50 names on their list are in fact registered voters. That's what those cases are about. But what they don't do is establish a proactive duty on the commission to inform political parties in advance all the possible consequences of decisions they might make. Now, and, and how, how, how does the commission then promote the provisions of section 19 of the constitution if if you say it does not have a duty to to inform the, the the parties as to the consequences how is the promotion of the provisions of section 19 then uh, uh, being uh, uh, being done it's being done by exactly what the commission has done here justice shangwe by having rules and in implementing those rules mutually across political parties and, and it's done by answering rules, rules which are not known. rules which are not known to the parties. 
I, I, the commission doesn't accept that a reasonable political party would not know that your choice on whether to put an abbreviation in your identifying document will have no consequences for you. Because although yeah, you're not. Sorry, do you, sorry. Do you concede that uh, no rules were published by the commission as far as the consequences of the abbreviation? I accept that there were no rules published by the commission, yes. But but I accept that it wasn't necessary for the commission to publish rules. Because if, if, you, if you vote, if you voted and you've seen uh, a war ballot paper, you know what it looks like. You know that it has the candidate name, the abbreviation and the logo. And that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed since the prior local government election. This has been the same what the commission has always done. It hasn't done anything different in this election. So, so we don't accept that there was any obligation on the commission to inform uh, Action SA or any other political parties uh, why it should or should not register an abbreviated name. That was a political choice for those political parties to take. And, and it's interesting, uh, Justice Shongwe, if you look, the original application by Action SA listed Action SA as an abbreviation and as the full name. And then it was rejected because it's of problems with its logo. And then when it reapplied, it, it didn't put it in there. But there was nothing stopping Action SA at any point from asking the commission or at any point from amending its abbreviation. No, I understand that. But as soon as when they made the second application to register and they elected not to register their abbreviation, uh, uh, am, I, am, I, am I right to say then the red light should have flickered on, on the commission to say, oh, their problem comes here because it means uh, their abbreviation will not come into the ballot paper and take the proactive action to advise them that, look, if you don't, these are the consequences because there were no rules which were publicized, which were sent to the parties. Justice Shumway, I don't accept that there was an obligation on the commission to do that. Certainly not an obligation that can lead to the relief that uh, Action SA now seeks. No, that's fine. Because, because it's important to be clear about what Action SA now wants. So, so e even, if, even if that is the case, Justice Shongwe, that the Commission should have informed um, uh, Action SA when it got the second application, that there should have been a red light and it should have said, do you realize the consequences? Mm -hmm. The Commission doesn't accept it for it to interfere in those choices of political parties or for it to try and influence in any way it would be improper for the commission to seek to influence a political party in how they choose to register their name. Um, but, but even if there was some type of obligation, that cannot get action as a what it seeks here. Because what it seeks here is an exemption from these rules. Right. So, so what it wants is to say, <clears throat> because our name is only eight letters long, it should be treated as an abbreviation. But any other party, and we know there are other parties, 14 other parties, that also didn't register uh, abbreviations for whatever reasons. Maybe they chose not to, maybe they were aware of the consequences, maybe not. We don't know why they didn't register abbreviations. But their names will not be on there because they're longer than eight letters, except for, for one party change, which is also less than eight letters. And, and that's an unjustified exemption. And they want to get an abbreviated name on without going through the registration process. They want to circumvent the legislative process that the legislature has put in place that isn't challenged before this court, that determines when you can get a registered abbreviated name. You can't just write to the commission and say, I want my abbreviated name to be X, and the commission puts it on the ballot paper. You have to go through the process. Now, no, I, I understand, Justice Shonga, that that, 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 that may... Yeah, you have made your point on that. Uh, you can proceed, I think. So I, I understand that, that in, in this case, it may seem somewhat facetious because Action SA is its full name and the abbreviation is the same as the full name. But that's, that the fact that in this case, it may seem that way isn't a reason to permit the circumvention of the process. But yes, so you may just, proceed. You may move you, on. So, so while, while I'm on this, this point, because I think it, it is a very important point, Justice Shangwe, is one of the arguments that the, the applicant makes is that what the commission should have done is mention this in the form, in the registration form, to say 
that the abbreviation will be used in the ballot paper. And then it would have been alerted about this uh, possible consequence of its decision. But just to say that, that the that form is an annexure to the regulations passed under the Electoral Commission Act, and there's no challenge to the regulations or to the form. So, so the form and the way that it's framed is a law, it's, it's a it's secondary legislation, and it must be accepted as valid and constitutional unless and until it's set aside. So the applicant can't rely on any flaw in the form or suggest that the commission should have just amended it when it hasn't attacked the regulations that create that form. Just a second. Had had uh, Action SA had they attacked the constitutionality of Section 23, or the form, or the regulations, would would that make a difference? So we, we don't. The, the Commission doesn't say that the the challenge can't be brought because they haven't attacked Section 23. All no, it no, means no. is that I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying. Had Action SA, had they framed their application in the sense of attacking the constitutionality of Section 23, would it have made a difference? Uh, it, it might have to the, the standards. So, so the Commission's position is this. We accept that it is possible to challenge decisions made under Section 23, but that those are not administrative action and it is owed a high degree of deference in any challenge brought to a decision taken under 23 on the design of the ballot, that it must be tested only on a rationality standard. Uh, and no challenge to 23 is necessary to that. It, it Notionally, you, you could bring a, sec a challenge to section 23 to say the discretion is not sufficiently circumscribed for the commission. But at the moment, it's, it's a very broad discretion given to the commission. So I, I, I don't think it would have made a difference to challenge section 23 it would have made a difference if they challenged the content of the application form. Because then they would be allowed to rely on the argument that they're now making without having challenged that form. Yes, you may proceed, Mr. Pichot. Thank you, Justice Bosser. So I'm just uh, finding my bearings because I've, I've moved around a bit to try and deal with Justice Shongwe's question. I just want to uh, get, get back in, into my notes. If I can have one second. You want to drink some bit of water? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to deal with the heat, I'll, no, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you, Justice Simba. Um, so, so, so just just to summarize what the commission's position is, and, and uh, I may be repeating some submissions here, but I just want to put it in, in context, is that it's important to note that the applicant doesn't object to the use of abbreviations. And it doesn't object to saying that we can't use full names on the ward ballots. It accepts all of that. Its only complaint relates to a very, very narrow category of two parties, which is it and change, whose full names happen to be less than eight uh, letters. It says those parties should be treated differently. And, and the commission's answer is, in short, Action SA had every opportunity to register the abbreviation. It chose not to do so. It's vital to follow the proper registration process. You can't get around the registration process by complaining about the ballot design because that undermines the key purpose of the registration process, which is to prevent confusion. Uh, and Action SA is registered as a name, not as an abbreviation. And it's not for the commission to make political choices to say, well, we think you would might want this as an abbreviation. It's for Action SA to make that decision. And the only way Action SA can make that decision is to amend its formal registration document. And so second, we say all reasonable parties would have been aware that abbreviations are used. The abbreviation, the use of the abbreviations is necessary and reasonable. And therefore the decision to use them is reasonable and necessary. And there was nothing preventing Action SA from using its name as its abbreviation if it wished to do so. So the commission hasn't obstructed in any way Action SA's choice, choices. It's just giving effect to its choices about how to register its position. So if, if I can then deal with some of the applicants' arguments, um, and, and I'll try not to repeat the, the answers I've already given Justice Shongwe. Um, but the, the way we said that they effectively have four arguments. <laughs> the first is that we've turned the uh, 
opportunity in Section 15.2c into a rule. The second is that we're choosing form over substance and that in doing so, we're violating Section 19 of the Constitution. The third is, is the one that I was debating with you, Justice Shongwei, is, is that we had a duty to inform political parties and failed to do so. And the last one is that, which is related, is that the Commission has acted contrary to its constitutional duties. So on the first one and whether it's been turned into rule, and I've made the submission already, it's absolutely correct, as the applicants say, that there's no obligation to register an abbreviated name. It says, if any. And so you may choose to register an abbreviated name or you may choose not to. But that doesn't mean that the Commission has turned it into a requirement. <clears throat> All the Commission has done is said, this is the way we're going to use the information that you choose to give us. So, so when a party fills in that form and has to choose its name, its abbreviation, provide its logo, the obvious reason for why it would be doing that is because that is the information that will appear on ballot papers. The, the, the very reason why you go through this complicated process to register where there's an opportunity for objections and we check that there isn't any confusion is so that when those names get on the ballot papers, there's no confusion. So it, it with respect, must be obvious to every political party registering that the information it's registering is what is going to appear on ballot papers. It, it, it doesn't seem to, to me that the commissioner had to specifically tell a political party something so obvious. And importantly, that parties are free at any time to amend the identifiers. <clears throat> and the fact that in this particular case, I accept it's too late now for Action SA to go through the process and amend the identifier before the election. But, but that's a result of, again, of Action SA's own conduct. So we said that the, the Commission hasn't turned this into a rule or a requirement. As I said in response to Justice Shongwe, Action SA is still on the ballot. It hasn't, it's not a requirement in order to compete in the elections. You just compete in the elections in the way that you chose to compete, which is without an abbreviation. And that was your choice. I think, I think you have made your point on yes. that score. I think you should I, proceed. I'm, I'm sorry, Justice Shong. I'm just trying to make sure I don't miss anything, but I, I take the point. I apologize. Okay. The, the, the next argument that the applicant makes is, is that the commission is effectively choosing form over substance. I, I made the, the, submission earlier with reference to the Encarta Freedom Party case, that this misunderstands the way that the Constitution protects free and fair elections. And what the applicant calls formalism is really vital to those free and fair elections. If I can just give the court three examples from the case law. The first is the Liberal Party case. Uh, it's the Constitutional Court case. I don't think it's in, in the heads of argument. If I can just give the court the reference. It's 2004, Volume 8, BCLR 810CC. And this was a case where, where the party had sought to register names 21 minutes late. And what the Constitutional Court said is, this is at paragraph 30, the applicant's inability to contest the forthcoming elections, therefore, arises solely from its failure to comply with the mandatory provisions of the Electoral Act and regulations and cannot be laid at the door of the commission. And we would say similarly here, the, the, the fact that on the ward ballot, there is no abbreviation arises solely from Action SA's choices. The, the, the second case is the Encarta Freedom Party case. And this was one where the party had uh, submitted its um, registration documents centrally and not at each local office of the commission as the act required. And what the court said in that case Paragraph 55 says the requirement that documents must be submitted to the local offices of the Commission does not undermine the right to vote and to stand for election. It simply gives effect to that right and underscores the decentralized and local nature of municipal elections. And we would say similarly here, the requirement that only a registered abbreviated names are put on ballot papers gives effect to the right to vote because it, it achieves the purpose of avoiding confusion providing certainty and ensuring the commission treats all parties equally. The, the third case I'd like to refer the court to is the, the National Freedom Party case. It's a decision of this court. 
uh, and this is again one where a, a deposit was paid late. And the relevant passage is paragraphs 30 to 32, where the court says, the election timetable is a regulatory mechanism to ensure free and fair elections. It cannot and should not be changed at the whim of an individual or party. If it is changed to suit individuals, the timetable becomes an inefficient electoral tool. The electoral process as a whole must be free and fair. It must be free and fair for all parties and not advance the interests of one party only. The ad hoc amendment of the election timetable will unfairly prejudice those parties who complied with its provisions. And we submit similarly here, the, the ballot design is a regulatory mechanism to ensure free and fair elections. And it cannot, the court should not permit ad hoc departures from that without undermining the freeness and fairness of the elections. So it meant that there's nothing different about this case. I, indeed, it makes out an even higher case for enforcing the rules, because in those cases, the parties were excluded from competing at all. Here, Action SA continues to be able to compete in the elections. Its name is on the ballot. And it's competing in line with the choices that it made. Maybe it subjectively did not foresee the consequences of those choices when it made them. But the Electoral Commission didn't provide it with any misinformation. It didn't mislead the applicant in any way about what the consequences of its political choices would be. The, the second point on this is my learned friend made much of the fact that there'd been a violation of Section 19, both of the right to stand in elections and of the right to vote. And obviously part of Section 19, as, as Justice Strong, where you put to me, is to promote the right, to promote participation and to enable participation, enable voting. But that's not the only part of section 19 and of voting in free and fair elections because it also requires fairness between parties which requires the 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 neutral and strict application of rules and it requires a system it requires an electoral system it requires the rules in order for the voting to happen at all that's the point that the constitutional court made in the new national party case that's the, the case about the the green id books and the court said there you have to have rules about who can vote and who can't vote and how we're going to identify those people in order to have elections at all. And so these rules are facilitative of the right, not limited of the right. If we don't have a ballot design, we can't have an election. And what the, the, the standard that the court set in, in New National Party, uh, it was talking about legislation, but we submit the same standard would apply to uh, decisions by the commission. It said, this is at paragraph 23 of New National Party, it said, uh, the act would infringe the right to vote if it is shown that, as at the date of the adoption of the measures, its probable consequences would be that those who want to vote would not have been able to do so, and we submit this is the important part, even though they acted reasonably in pursuit of that right. So here the question is, has Action SA been prevented from fairly competing in the election, even though it acted reasonably in pursuit of the right, or a hypothetical party that acted reasonably to try and exercise its right to stand for elections, would that hypothetical reasonable party, or the probable consequence of this ballot design, be to limit its ability to fairly compete? And we say no, because a hypothetical reasonable party would either know already the importance of an abbreviation or would find out from the commission before settling its registration document. And so any reasonable party would either would know in advance what the consequences of not putting up an abbreviation would be. And so the only negative consequences are for those parties who choose not to put an abbreviation or did not act reasonably. But the ballot design if it only has unfair effects on unreasonable parties, does not limit section 19. And then if we look at the right to vote, so the, the applicant also argues that the commission limits the right to vote because those people who wish to vote for Action SA will be confused and will not be able to do so. <clears throat> and we, we have two submissions on that. The first is that there, there's no violation, if there's no violation of the party's right to compete, 
then there's no violation of the citizen's right to vote. So this argument has been made in cases like in Carter Freedom Party, where the, the IFP said, all the people who want to vote for us will be precluded from doing so because you won't let us on the ballot. And the court said, well, that's the consequence of, of having rules for an election. And their right to vote has not been limited because the party they wish to vote for failed to comply with the rules. And similarly here, you want to vote for Action SA, you vote for it on the terms on which it's registered. There's no limitation of the right to vote there. But also, people are still able to vote for Action SA. And I think it's very important to note that they'll be able to vote on the ward candidate ballot if they recognize the name of the ward candidate. As Justice Mbar pointed out, most people who, who are interested in an election should know who their ward candidate is. And if I'm thinking about voting for Action SA, I should find out in advance what the name of the ward candidate is. And also the logo appears on it. Now, Action SA says we're a new party, people don't know our logo. But that can't be a concern that affects the commission because you've got to have an objective look at this. It's got to, the rules have got to be the same for new parties and old parties. Uh, and so a, a voter will be able to identify a party by its logo, even though it doesn't have an abbreviation. In addition, every voter will get two ballots. You get your PR ballot and you get your ward ballot and you go into the booth and you put your cross on both of them. The PR ballot has the full name Action SA and the logo next to it. So the PR ballot will help any confused voter to identify Action SA's logo while they're in the booth. So we submit that, that in these circumstances, there is no limitation of the right to vote. And any limitation that there might be is justifiable for all the reasons I've given. The need for a clear neutral system, the strict application of those rules, and the need to protect the registration process. <laughs> the, the third argument advanced by the applicants is about the failure to inform, and I, I, I've dealt with that in response to Justice Stronger's question. I won't repeat my submissions. So if, if I, just, just one small point. Um, my learned friend, Ms. Asim, said that the, the HSRC study uh, doesn't aid the Commission. If I can just refer the court to page 54 of the papers. So, so this is the, the study that, that Action SA attaches to, or, or it's a, a PowerPoint of the study. Um, and, and the last bullet, which so it talks about international guidelines and empirical evidence, say that ballot paper should be clear and easy, and then international studies conclude that voters often make use of shortcuts, such as graphics to identify the party of their choice. And then importantly, it says, this was confirmed by all focus groups and the main party identifier on the ballot being the logo and acronym. Uh, Mr. So, so you said page 54. Yes, I hope that's, that's on, on my numbering. It's page 54. It, it starts primary party identifiers. Oh, yes, 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 I'm there, yes. Sorry, and the, the bottom bullet is the one I want to focus on, uh, that the main identifiers are the logo and the acronym. So Action SA did have this last year. If it had read it, it would know that having an acronym was very important in order for your party to be identified on the ballot. And it could then have taken steps to amend its registration, to include the abbreviation, but it chose not to. So the, the last argument of the commission, oh, sorry, of the of the applicant that I need to address relates to its claim about the commission's constitutional duties. And it says the commission has, as, as you put to me, Justice Shang, these proactive duties to take steps to inform parties and candidates even before they're asked any questions. Uh, and we have three responses. The, the first is that in our view, the argument doesn't really uh, take the argument much further, because if if the court concludes, as we submit it should, that the ballot design was otherwise rational and constitutional, then the Commission's duties aren't a separate basis to declare it unlawful. The Commission's duties need to feed into that assessment. In addition, for all the reasons I've already given, the decision was consistent with its duties. Uh, and then I'd like to deal with the, the two cases that the applicant relies on, the, the Kai Ma case 
and the Johnson case. So I've made the point already in response to Justice Shungwe that these cases are very different. But if I can ask the court to look at paragraph 13 of the Kaimar decision when it uh, considers this matter, because that sets up what the facts are. Uh, or, and those are the facts that are accepted by the court, which is that they, the party had approached the commission and the commission had given it certain information. And then what it says at the end of the paragraph is following this conversation, Mr. Jano, who was the representative of the party, was left with a clear impression that only one form existed and that there was no separation between district municipal nomination forms and those from local municipalities. Mr. Jano consequently added the name, added the applicant's district proportional candidate's name to the same form. So they put the names on the wrong form as a result of bad advice they got from the Electoral Commission's office. And I, we accept that in, in those circumstances where a candidate or party approaches the commission and the commission either fails to respond or gives it inaccurate or misleading advice, that then the party may well have a complaint. But that's not what happened here. And that's not what the case stands for. We know that because the SCA heard an appeal in this matter. The appeal is uh, reported as Electoral Commission of South Africa versus Cape Party and others. Uh, 2017 ZASCA 161. So it, there, was a, there were two appeals, the, the Cape Party appeal and the, and the Kaima appeal, which are heard together. The judgment deals with both of them. Uh, the, the main issue there was a, a question of fact and whether the electoral court had correctly applied Plascon Evans. And the court held that it hadn't and it shouldn't have accepted the applicant's version. But it also says at paragraph 28, it says this. The amici contended that in a modern democratic state, the IEC should have been more proactive in their advice to the party. In other words, the amici argued that the IEC's advice concerning the question of registration at different centers could have been more helpful to the party. And then the SCA says that was not the party's case. So that's that proposition that Action SA tries to draw from the decision that there's some proactive duty on the commission to give this type of advice. The ACA says very clearly is not the case. The, the second judgment my learned friend relies on is the Johnson case. And I, I don't need to get into the details. The relevant paragraph is paragraph 38. And again, what you'll see there is that the party, you had to have a list of 50 registered voters in order to compete in the election. And they went to the Electoral Commission's office and said, we want to make sure that these 50 names are registered voters. They didn't have the voters role yet. They couldn't check it for themselves. And the official of the part of the commission said, I will check it for you and get back to you. He then didn't get back to them in time. And by the time he, he, he did, it was too late for them to comply with the deadline. And it turned out that some of the 50 names are not registered voters. And then naturally the party complained because it felt that it had been misled by the commission. And this court held that it had because it had there'd been an undertaking to respond, to get back to the party about whether these names had been, these, the names were registered voters or not. And the party was relying on the commission to do that and it, it broke that undertaking. So, so again, in, in those sort of situations, I can fully understand why the commission's failure to give advice uh, accurately or at all would be a basis for complaint. But none of those cases hold that there's a proactive duty, even in advance of an approach to the commission, to provide advice to parties about the consequences of decisions they might take, particularly about their names, which is a core political consideration for the party. And we submit that the, the principle that Action SA is trying to establish would have very wide ranging effects. It wouldn't only apply to ballot design or party registration. It would apply to any other situation where a party makes an error don't, does not comply with some electoral regulation or requirement, and then comes to court afterwards and says, but the commission didn't tell me. The commission should have approached me and told me I was going to make a mistake. And if it had told me, I wouldn't have made the mistake. But if, if that's going to be a principle this court establishes, it is going to open the floodgates for litigation of this type. Because it was very easy for a party, when it makes an error, to then blame the commission for not saving it from itself. And we said that would put an undue and unworkable burden on the Electoral Commission. 
just as important. Those are my submissions on on the merits. Uh, I, I see. I've, I've finished my hour. I, I'm I'm almost done. I just have to deal with the uh, our point about when the the court should decide the matter, and then with the issue of remedy. So I, I think I'll need about another ten minutes. Yes, no. You may Thanks, proceed. <laughs> So, so the, the next submission is, is, in our view, it's more appropriate for the court not to decide the case and tell Action SA to come back after the election. And we'd want to refer the court to paragraph 197 of the recent decision of the Constitutional Court in the Electoral Commission versus Minister of Corruptive Governance, the, the postponement case. And this is what Justice Rogers, Acting Justice Rogers said. Sorry, a paragraph? 197. Yeah. He says, there might, despite imperfection in the elections, be no challenge, or the challenge might be confined to certain municipalities. Even if there were a nationwide challenge, an ex post facto inquiry allows the matter to be assessed with reference to the circumstances which have actually unfolded, rather than requiring functionaries and perhaps courts to engage on short notice in a predictive exercise on contested evidence. An ex post facto challenge would be the occasion to decide what exactly the standard of freeness and fairness entail in the circumstances. And we submit that's true here as well. Because, and we want to point the court to seven factors to consider. The first is that the commission says it's impossible to remedy this problem before the election, even if the applicant succeeds on the merits. I'll get to that argument in a bit more detail, but that is the position of the commission. And it seems that it must at the very least be some doubt about whether it is possible to remedy the problem before the election. The second consideration is that it is not possible to postpone this election. I, I understood Mr. Seem to argue that it, it could be postponed. And we'd submit strongly that that is not possible for three reasons. No. No, 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 I think she said that it would be possible perhaps to postpone the election for a specific ward or wards where think, SA is, is, is contesting. Even that we submitted is not possible, uh, Justice Simba. So, so for, for the, I accept it's not for the, the nationwide election, but even for these elections, postponement is not constitutionally possible. Uh, the, the, the first reason we say is that it has not been sought that there's no prayer for postponement. The first time it's raised is an oral argument. So the commission hasn't had the opportunity to consider it or tell this court what its position is on the postponement of an election. The, the second is that the, the constitutional court made it clear in the postponement case that it is not possible. In fact, the, the relevant passages are, are paragraphs 154, G and H, where it says that uh, under section one, because of the deadline in section 159 of the constitution, it's not permissible for a court in advance to employ that section, to, to employ section 171B of the constitution to postpone the elections in contravention of the constitutional time limit. It then says that, that there may be very unusual situations that could permit a postponement, but it says those would be, quote, in rare and exceptional circumstances. This is not a rare and exceptional circumstance. So what the, the basis of the court's holding in that case <clears throat> is that the, the deadline ends on 1 November, elections must be held. If for some reason an election is held then and is not free and fair because of COVID-19 or because of Action, Action SA's abbreviation is not on the, on the ballot, you resolve that through ex post facto challenges. And the Municipal Electoral Act creates a framework for those challenges, creates the necessary remedies. And that's yes. the correct way to go. But Mr. Bishop, do you accept that under, I think it's section 172 of the Constitution, even though a relief was not specifically sought, uh, the court could, in its discretion, you know, grant what, it, what uh, it would consider to be a just and equitable relief, uh, which could, in fact, um, be. I'm not saying this is the case, but I'm mm. just that the principle is established that. Yes. A court could grant just and equitable uh, uh, relief, even the situation warrants it, even though this was not specifically requested mm. in the notice of motion. Do you accept that? Yes, I do, Justin. I mean, the, the, I think the case law on that is clear. Yes. But but I, I think in deciding whether to exercise that power, 
the court must consider whether the parties have had a, an adequate opportunity to address the matter and yes. address the remedy. And, and here, not only has it not been sought, so the commission hasn't had an opportunity on affidavit to respond to it, but also none of the other effective parties had been joined. So uh, the commission is not now taking the non-joined point given the nature of the relief sought by Action SA. But if it had sought postponement of the elections, then non-joined would be a real problem. Because I think as the court put to my learned friend, it will prejudice the other parties who have invested money, time and resources to compete in an election on the 1st of November. And that is money, time and resources they can't get back. And so if the election is now postponed, they will be prejudiced. And it, it may nonetheless be just and equitable, but this court would be very, very hesitant to grant that order without even hearing from those parties who will, will be affected by such an order. But, but I come back to the main submissions, it's just not constitutionally possible to postpone the election past 1 November because that is the constitutional deadline. It must be held then. The, the third factor why we'd submit that this court should, should instead require Action SA to bring an ex post facto challenge <coughs> is, that the is the nature of the challenge. So it's not one where uh, Action SA is going to be precluded from competing at all. It will compete. It just submits that it's got a disability in the competition because its name, its abbreviation isn't on the ward ballot paper. But it, it's not one where it, it's going to be completely excluded from the election. The fourth factor is that we will only know the real impact after the election. How many voters will in fact be confused? How many wards will the outcome, will that confusion affect the outcome of the election? I've explained earlier why there's good reason to think that not very many voters will be confused because the name of the candidate, the logo and the PR ballot with Action SA's name next to the logo will be before every voter. So it's not clear that there will be significant confusion at all, at least not enough to render it unfree and unfair. Uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, how, how will we determine the confusion? Because a voter may not vote at all. And uh, how will we know there was a confusion? I think this, this court can't know it beforehand, but I think it would be possible after the fact, you by running uh, exit polls or other surveys to determine what the extent of confusion was after the fact. So that sort of evidence could be laid in an ex post facto challenge. It, now we are all to some degree speculating, Justice Shungwe. Okay, no, fine. But now supposing then there is a, a, a ex post facto challenge and, 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 and the court agrees with uh, action SA, what then? Well, the, the, that, that was my fifth factor, Justice Shungwe, is, is that then the court can in fact give action SA an effective remedy which it may not be able to get here, which is the rerunning of the election. So it, it will declare the relevant elections in the relevant wards and the relevant um, municipalities, uh, set them aside and require by-elections to be held. That's the framework contemplated in the Municipal Electoral Act. And that will give Action SA uh, you know, and, and all the other parties of ability to compete again. So obviously we submit none of this is necessary because the Commission's acted lawfully, but uh, if in an ex post facto challenge, that is what was found, there is a remedy available for Action SA. Okay. The, the sixth factor we'd consider is, is that Action SA may in fact be satisfied with its results and decide not to challenge the elections. I, uh, I appeared in the postponement application before the Constitutional Court, not for the Commission, and I, I was doing some research in preparation about the 1994 elections, and there were significant complaints about the freeness and fairness of those elections relating both to the IFP stickers. There were allegations that right wing groups were hacking into the commission systems uh, to try and change the results. There was widespread violence, ballot papers were lost, things that ordinarily could undermine the freeness and fairness of elections. But they were accepted as free and fair by the parties because the parties more or less got the votes they expected to get. And so if action is a may decide it's satisfied with the results and not bring the challenge. The Constitutional Court also mentions this in the postponement application. Uh, and the, the last and final fact is that an ex post facto challenge will allow a less speedy uh, consideration of the of these difficult and complex issues. This court is obviously under a lot of pressure, as have been the parties and, and the lawyers in preparing this application. 
there won't be the same pressure in an ex post facto challenge. So for all those reasons, we submit that the appropriate course is for the Commission to say, we're not deciding the merits of the application, the election must run its course, but we're not precluding Action SA after the fact from arguing that as a result of its abbreviation not being on the ballot paper, the election was not free and fair and it should be rerun. The, the, the final heading I need to address, Justices, is the remedy. So if the court is against us on the merits and is against us on this suggestion of an ex post facto challenge, what remedy can the court, excuse me, can the court grant? So, so we said what, what Action SA is really looking for here is, is setting aside the Commission's decision of how to design the ballot paper and asking this court to substitute that decision with its own decision of how to design the ballot paper. And we submit that substitution is inappropriate. And then in addition, we submit that the remedy they seek in terms of reprinting or putting stickers on is impossible before the election. So to deal first with, with substitution, what the uh, applicant is asking for in its amended notice of motion, uh, if I can maybe just take your uh, the court there, in paragraph, I think it's paragraph six, um, Oh, sorry, paragraph three of the amended notice of motion. What is the page? It's on page seven. Does the court have it? So, so the first, so this is the alternative relief. It says declaring that the determination of the ballot design is unlawful. And then 3.2, the words eighth letter name of a political party is to be read in next to the word abbreviation on the 2021 ballot paper. So effectively what they're saying is the decision the commission took was in that column, we will only put the abbreviation. And it's asking the court to substitute that decision of the commission with the decision that it will be the abbreviation or an eight letter registered name. Uh, it calls it reading in, but it's a substitution. And the, 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 the justices are well aware of the principles for substitution. They, they set out in the TrendCon judgment. And the two key requirements for a substitution order are that the court must be in as good a position as the administrator to make the decision, and that the decision must be a foregone conclusion. So it's only when those two factors are present that a court will grant a substitution order rather than a remittal order. And we submit that neither of those factors are present here. Firstly, how you design the ballot paper is a complex issue. If the courts had an opportunity to go through both the Human Science Research Council report and through the ballot design document that the commission attaches to its affidavit, you'll see that there are multiple factors in, in play, both in terms of what order the columns go in, how the parties are ranked in those, uh, in the rows on the ballot paper, various factors that they have to consider. So it's not a simple issue, and the commission is best placed to take those decisions, not the court. But secondly, the outcome is not a foregone conclusion, because there may well be various other ways in which the commission could accommodate Action SA, other than the solution they propose. So it may be possible, we don't know, to uh, have up to nine letters. So it could be any political party whose names has nine letters. Perhaps that can be squeezed in or 10 letters if we're not going to go with registered abbreviations. It may be, uh, uh, the commission may, if the matter was remitted to it, say, look, it's not fair to just give the advantage to Action SA, whose name happens to be eight letters. We should now give the opportunity to all other parties to nominate an abbreviated name and that that's the fairer option. It may think of various other ways that are, would resolve an illegality, but are different to what Action SA proposes. And so that we submit as a reason why the substitution remedy they seek is inappropriate. The second reason the relief they think is in a, the relief they seek is inappropriate is that it is impossible. So we are now nine days away from the 30th of October, which is the real deadline because that's when special votes start. And so the ballots need to be at the voting stations by really the 29th of October, so that when 
the electoral commission officials with the party representatives go out to uh, allow people to cast their special votes they have the ballot paper and if necessary they have the sticker to put on the ballot paper so that's the deadline it's really the 29th of october which is eight days away and it also emphasized that th this application is brought obviously on, on motion proceedings and Pascon Evans applies. So the court should accept the commission's version uh, unless it's not a credible version. Uh, another point to emphasize is that the whether the relief can be granted or not must be assessed on the current facts. So even if the court thinks that the commission could have done more to try and get providers uh, ready to print ballot papers or print uh, new stickers. <laughs> the facts are what they are. And this court should not give a remedy that the commission cannot comply with, merely because it thinks maybe the commission should have tried harder in the past. So if I can deal separately with the original relief, which is the reprinting relief, and then with the amended relief, which is the, the sticker relief. So the, the Commission's answer on the original relief appears at paragraph 26 of the answering affidavit from pages 99 to 100 of the record. And I emphasize that this affidavit was deposed to nine days ago on the 12th of October 2021. So it reflects the position then. And what the Commission Have says is, uh, uh, it begins at paragraph 99. 99. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, sorry pa paragraph 26, page 99. Yes. So, so it says the commission has already concluded a competitive bidding process where only four printers met the requirements. The Commission therefore contracted such capacity for a definitive time frame within which ballot papers must be printed, commenced on 2 October, and they're due to be completed on the 20th of October, which was yesterday. And then it says a reprint of ballots would negatively impact this time frame and would require it to be extended. There is no guarantee that the contracted printers would have capacity available for what would be a relatively large unscheduled job. This would then result in the, unavail of the availability of the printers not being guaranteed and uncertainty in relation to whether ballot papers will be reprinted and distributed to the relevant localities in time for the special votes on 30 and 31 uh, October. So what the Commission says is that it, it does not know whether it will be able to comply with an order. So then in the reply, what the applicant says is, well, why don't you print stickers or have stamps? And it puts up the affidavit of Mr. Short, who says we can do it on six days notice. So it, uh, you know, so it comes up with an alternative, and the commission has four answers to the proposal around printing stickers or uh, stamps. The first is that it, it it puts up positive evidence to say that it lacks the capacity to comply with such an order. So this is the the further affidavit that was filed on Tuesday. Uh, I hope that the commission uh, that that the court has that affidavit. Yes, we we have. Yes. So what it says at paragraph 14 of that affidavit, I'm sorry, my, that for me that affidavit is not paginated, but it's paragraph 14, I think it's on the fourth page of that affidavit. So it, it says, on the information available to the Commission, Shave and Gibson, that's Mr. Short's company, does not have spare capacity to undertake this exercise, and the Commission's other printers do not have spare capacity either. This is not a situation where the Commission can simply walk to the printer down the road and have the stickers printed. And, and it, it explains in more detail that it made a request to uh, Shave and Gibson, and they weren't able to comply with that request to print additional ballot papers because they had constrained capacity. But that's the, the summary of, of what the Commission says. It says, we, we don't think we can print these stickers. The second point is that what Mr. Short says is that they can, it'll take them six days from the date of the order to print the stickers or prepare the uh, stamps, the rubber stamps. <clears throat> it's unclear if that includes weekends or not, but assuming it includes weekends, that if this court grants an order tomorrow, the stickers and the stamps will be ready on the 28th. 
And then according to Mr. Short, they need one more day for delivery to the provincial warehouses of the commission. That takes us to the 29th. And then the, the stamps and the, or, or the stickers would need to be at the boating stations on the 29th. So it seems that at this point, even if we accept Mr. Short's version, it's just not possible to get this done in time and ensure that in fact, the ballots reach the voting stations by the day. Because it would be a far greater interference with the freeness and fairness of these elections to not have uh, enough, um, or, or to have the, the stickers or the stamps appearing at some voting stations and not at other voting stations within the same ward. The third uh, submission we'd make is that it, it seems to us that on the applicant's approach, which is that it wants to substitute the commission's decision that it's only in the third column, it's only an abbreviated name to abbreviated name or registered name less than eight letters, that that would apply both to it and to change because change is also fewer than eight letters. And so it would also need to uh, be included. But it doesn't seem in the quote provided by Mr. Short to have included the stickers that would be needed to be put on the row where change appears. We don't know how many stickers would be needed for that, how much longer it would take to print those stickers, whether that is possible. Because what the applicant quite rightly is, is asking for is not a rule only for Action SA, but for Action SA and other parties in a similar position. And we know there is at least one other party in that position. So this court doesn't know how that will affect the timing and capacity uh, in order to comply with any such order. Um, Mr. Bishop, I want to make sure I understand you on this part. Uh, I'm, I'm, am I understanding you to say that the proposed solution of stickers or stamps as proposed would not only be in relation of action SA only. It would have to include yeah. other parties as well in a similar position. Yes, because if, if you look at the, well, the there's two parts to the relief that Action SA seeks. The first part is in pre three of the amended notice of motion, where it says it wants to read in the words eight letter name of political party next to the word abbreviation. But then in, in the specific relief that it seeks, which I think is in paragraph um, six of the amended notice of motion, uh, that's where it says it, it only wants to print stickers bearing the name Action SA and distribute those yes. stickers to the polling stations. Yes, that's why I'm asking. Uh, yes, but but it, it seems to us that that, that relief, if the, if the court was going to grant relief requiring the commission to print stickers, that it would be inappropriate for it to order it only to do it for Action SA and not for change, having given the substitution relief the applicant seeks in paragraph 3.2. I see. I see. Thank you. <laughs> the, the final one is, is that the stickers are not, a, or stamps, are not a, a great solution for two reasons. The first is that there, there's a risk of mistakes, that they may be applied to the wrong place. And secondly, that they can actually create an advantage for the political party because the sticker stands out from the rest of the ballot. And so if, if there's a sticker put on, your eyes are immediately drawn to Action SA. And so ironically, it would give Action SA an advantage over other parties to have a sticker or, or a stamp. A stamp would have the same consequence because it will look different from the other um, political parties. So, so to, to, to sum up on the issue of remedy, the commission's position is this. <laughs> it is not possible at this stage to fix the problem. And so, if the court is going to decide the merits and give a remedy and not tell Action SA to come back after the elections, then all it can do is issue declarations and say what the commission did was unlawful, but given the limited time available, given the unusual situation we're in where it's impossible to postpone the elections because they've already been pushed to the very, very last day, uh, we cannot give you a more practical remedy. Because this, this, this court should not direct the, the commission to do something it cannot do. Finally, uh, just some bar on the question of costs. Uh, the commission doesn't seek costs if it is successful, but it submits that there should be also no order as to costs if the application succeeds. 
um, it, it is the ordinary uh, practice in this court not to grant costs. And if I can also refer the court to a recent decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal on this question, it's Electoral Commission of South Africa versus Democratic Alliance. And the citation is 2021, volume five, South African Law Reports 476, SCA, paragraph 58. And the SCA again makes the point that there the generally should not be cost orders against the Commission, even when they've found, been found to have acted unlawfully. Uh, Justice, may I just check if, if I have any further instructions um, yes. from my, my attorneys or my juniors? Yes. Just for me one moment. My junior says he is happy. So unless there are any questions from the court, those are our submissions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Uh, I want to check my colleagues. Uh, any questions, colleagues, before I let Mr. Bishop off? Oh, there doesn't seem to be any question. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. As the court pleases, thank you, Justice Moore. Ms. Hassan, your reply. Thank you, Justice Mba. I'll try to keep it as, as tight as possible. Yeah. A lot of what uh, my learned friend uh, dealt with, I had already addressed by either directly in my argument in chief or through the questions that were posed to me by the court. Um, so I'll try not to repeat those. Um, let me start, I'm going to go in the order as I picked uh, these issues up. First of all, uh, my learned friend says that Action SA must go through the legislative process again. Uh, this legislative process is what we've dealt with in our heads of argument, the Section 16A argument. What my learned friend doesn't say uh, and, and, and address is what the purpose of the legislative process is and why Action SA should be required to go through that uh, again when it has already met the purpose of that legislative process. I've dealt with that in my uh, argument in chief. Secondly, there's a lot of uh, 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 there's a lot of argument about the importance of rules and the importance of systems in managing elections. But my learned friend, when asked, where are the rules that uh, say that an abbreviation will be used in a ballot? He responded, I can't point to a rule. Well, the commission can't have it both ways. It can't insist on the importance of the rules, which we agree um, with the commission on is very important, but then say for this, there is no rule. For this important issue of uh, an abbreviation and a name on the ballot paper, there is no rule. My learned friend then goes on to say, well, that's because it's not a requirement. Uh, it's not a it's not a requirement to have your registered abbreviation uh, on the ballot paper, but that's inconsistent with what they've argued before. It clearly is a requirement. He says, look, you can still participate in elections. There'll just be a blank space. But that is exactly the complaint of the, uh, the, the applicant in this case, is that there is a blank space, and it is the blank space that is misleading to voters. So to place the onus on Action SA, as the commission would suggest, uh, in the absence of a rule, um, is, is unreasonable. It says that Action SA, the Commission says, to, Action SA should have approached the Commission if it was unsure. It should have asked for help. The onus is on Action SA. But there's nothing uh, to trigger the doubt on the part of Action SA with regard to the question of a registered abbreviation and the ballot paper. There's no basis for it to be unsure. And that's why it did not approach uh, the commission any earlier. Um, when it did approach the commission, the commission continued to hold the, the, the stance that we've already explained. I mean, this is important because there is nothing on the registration form to alert a party of the importance of the registration form for the ballot paper. That issue of the abbreviation, my learned friend refers to the choice of Action SA, that Action SA chose not to have an, uh, an abbreviation. Well, first of all, Action SA did not make a choice not to have its name on the ballot paper. That was never its choice. But the commission also misses the point of Action SA's name. It is not an abbreviation. 
It is simply one name that serves all purposes. And the form does not make it clear that you've got to register the same name in the same form several times in order to meet the requirements of a ballot paper. So we come to the ballot paper and the question of a challenge to section 23 itself. Uh, I just want to address one point on that, and that is that my learned friend said that we could have challenged section 23 itself by saying that the, 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 the section doesn't sufficiently circumscribe the discretion of the commission. But that, that's quite extraordinary to, to, to challenge that uh, section on that basis, because there does not need to be a clause in the act or a clause or an addendum to section 23 to say that the commission, to say to the commission, when you exercise your power, exercise it lawfully. That is what the commission is required to do. The, the, the legislation itself does not have to spell it out. But then my learned friend talks about, well, you should have known in any event, and we were referred to the HSRC study, uh, and we were referred to page 54, but as I pointed out to this court in chief, if you turn over the slide, the very next point is the focus groups, however, agree that the party name should be on the ballot. And there's one other important point regarding the study, and that is on page 50 of the, of the record. Because this report, appropriately, is um, quite careful to express what the limitations of the study were. And at page 50, it says what the lim limitations are. And it says the study relied on focus groups with a fairly small sample uh, of the voting age public. And the focus groups did not involve participants completing ballot papers under real life electoral or voting station context. And the study exclusively focused on uh, ballot uh, papers. The important thing is that this was a very small focus group and that it is not uh, uh, um, appropriate to therefore generalize from a small study. In any event, so, so that was not sufficient. This, this, this study is not sufficient um, evidence to, to, to say that uh, on this basis, Action SA should have known. But, but the, the, the commission also says, well, Action SA should have known because um, it's been done this way in the past. And in that regard, I'd like to refer the court to paragraph 45 of the answering affidavit, which is on page 105. Ooh. And what, what the commission says is that it first exercised its powers under section 23 in, 20, in, in the year 2000. That design is periodically reviewed and has been revised over time, including for this upcoming election. So it's not a question of, well, there's one design, that is the design that has been in place for years immemorial, and that should therefore be enough to alert the parties. Then uh, if I may turn to some of the case law that was referred to. Um, firstly, the Liberal Party case. The Liberal Party case dealt with the requirement uh, of mandatory provisions and that there was non-compliance with mandatory provisions of the statute. Here, there is no question of non-compliance with anything. The provisions of uh, the, the, the registration forms, the act and the regulations make it optional. So the, the case doesn't, uh, is not a useful analogy uh, and a useful comparator for this, for this context. Then it comes, we come to the Kaimar case, and the Kaimar case, my learned friend, uh, correctly refers to the Cape Party Supreme Court of Appeal decision. But that Supreme Court of Appeal decision did not overturn the legal proposition regarding the proactive duty that rests on the commission. What happened in the Supreme Court of Appeal was that it recognized that in fact, the case was based on a dispute of fact and the dispute of fact did not favor the Kaima party. So it turned on a factual basis and it did not overturn that proposition. And in any event, 
that legal proposition is in is contained in other judgments of the constitutional court, such as New National Party, Justice Langer's uh, dicta, and, uh, and and in ACDP, the dicta of Justice O'Regan. So then we get to remedy. Um, the ex well, look, the, the stamps and, and, the, and the rubber and, and the stickers we've dealt with. What the commission now says is, well, look at the amount of time it's going to take. Firstly, that's the first objection in order to comply with even the timetable that was suggested by Mr. Short in his affidavit. And they say, well, you're asking the commission to do something that is impossible and that is not appropriate for this court to ask uh, the commission to do something that's not impo that, that is impossible. On that uh, point and on that issue of impossibility, I refer the court to the judgment and the postponement, what, we, what we've been calling the postponement case, uh, the recent uh, case of the Electoral Commission versus Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Because the same argument was raised there by the commission, the point of impossibility. And, uh, uh, and, and it was dealt with in paragraph 54 and 55 of that judgment. And the court referred to the case of Monsisi, where the appellate division, and I'm now quoting from the judgment at, at paragraph 54, where the appellate division said this, under certain circumstances, compliance with the provisions of statutes, which prescribe how something is to be done, will be excused. Thus, in accordance with the maxim of lex non cogit ad impossibilia, that's the impossibility argument, if it appears that the performance of the formalities prescribed by the statute has been rendered impossible by circumstances over which persons interested had no control, like an act of God or the king's enemies, these circumstances will be taken as a valid excuse. As it was, the court did not accept that excuse in the Electoral Commission uh, postponement case. But the doctrine doesn't apply here because the problem that we face regarding time is not the making of is the making of the commission itself, and we've dealt with that the problem of the time constraints and when this could have been remedied, and it was not. So it's not to say, well, now we have run out of time because we only have a few days left, and that is an impossible situation for us um, to manage. Then he, uh, my learned friend, very uh, um, eloquently referred to the Trencon judgment and the issue of substitute, substitutability and said, well, this court cannot substitute uh, the decision of the IEC by making its own decision with regard to remedy. And this is not uh, a good example of um, an, an analogy I would submit as well. The Trencon, uh, Trencon case dealt with what an appropriate remedy is in the context of PAJA and Section 8 of PAJA. We have raised a constitutional challenge to the ballot paper and to the exclusion of Action SA's name on the ballot paper. We would submit that the appropriate case for this court to have regard to when it comes to appropriate remedies and what is just and equitable is the following, and, and, and I'll give the court the citation. It's um, Head of Department, Pumalanga Department of Education and another, versus her school, Ermelo. And the citation is 2010, volume two of the South African Law Reports, page 415, and it's a judgment of the Constitutional Court and specifically, it's a judgment of former Deputy Chief Justice Mosineke. And at paragraph 97, Justice Mosineke deals with just and equitable remedy under section 172 of the Constitution. And he begins by saying that it confers wide remedial powers on a competent court adjudicating a constitutional matter. He goes on to say, this ample and flexible remedial jurisdiction in constitutional disputes permits a court to forge an order that would place substance above mere form by identifying the actual underlying dispute between the parties and by requiring the parties to take steps directed at resolving the dispute. My learned friend says, well, 
the remedy that we want means that only Action SA would get its name on the ballot paper, would, would get its name on the ballot paper and not change. There is only one. They refer to 14 political parties in the answering affidavit. There is only one political party that has uh, eight letters or less in its name, and that is the political party change. They've not sought to challenge uh, these, uh, to, to, to join these proceedings. They've not sought to challenge the commission on the design of the ballot paper. Why that is, we can only speculate. Perhaps it's because their logo has the word change in it. What this court can't do is say, well, because we can't provide relief to everyone, we should not provide relief to anyone. That would not be consistent with the court's duties, the wide remedial power under um, Section 172 of the Constitution. If this court were to find that there is a violation, then there must be a remedy. And the remedy, as we have said, for these elections is for Action SA's name to be included. And for the next election, uh, for, the, for the commission to, to, to go back to the drawing board with regard to its design, we're not asking this court to determine the design of the ballot paper. We are not asking this court to substitute uh, the Commission's determination of the design of the ballot paper with its own determination. That is for the Commission to do. It has five years to do it before the next local government elections. So those are my submissions in reply, uh, Justice Mba. So, so you are saying the remedy you seek is for action South Africa's name to be included in the ballot? That is correct. That you are seeking now. Okay. And, and the Commission must find a way to do it. Now, can I, can I hear your comment on the question of ex post facto uh, a consideration of an oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me of that, Justice uh, Shongwe. That doesn't help us at all. First of all, and my learned friend referred to some studies about, uh, you know, where ex post facto challenges tend not to be brought, and I don't know what reasons there would be. But perhaps one reason would be lack of resources. It would be extraordinarily expensive for the political party involved here to relitigate this issue uh, and, to, and to rerun and to ask for a rerun of an election after it's already taken place. So maybe it's an issue of resources. Uh, that my, that, that, that's part of the reason why in those studies, exposed factor challenges don't take place. But certainly it's not an answer to say to remedy the violation, Action SA, come back again after the elections are over. That's the first point. And the second is, they've not provided a, um, an answer as to how we are to determine whether a voter understood, uh, whether a voter understood whether Action SA is on the ballot or not or excess or didn't or was confused about the ballot paper. Perhaps the IEC will run exit polls itself uh, uh, after the elections, but it's not possible for, uh, I don't see how it's possible for Action SA to be able to determine which voters and how many voters were confused by the ballot paper and to therefore bring an ex post facto challenge on that basis. Um, it, it, it's a relief that it, it's, it's tantalizing, I understand, for the Commission because it postpones the problem. But it's not an answer to the question that there should be a remedy now. So if I understand you correctly, um, the bottom line as far as you are concerned on the question of uh, the remedy is the stamp or sticker? That's what we have proposed. Uh, that, that was the best that we could come up with. We were guided by what happened in the 1994 elections uh, and the placement of stickers on the ballot paper then. Um, and that is, that is why we offered that as a solution. So it's the stamp or it's the stickers. We accept yeah. that reprinting the ballot papers at this stage may not be possible. As to how they, that is the commission, goes about uh, getting it right, that is their baby. That is correct. Thank you. Any other question, colleagues? 
Could I just uh, clarify one issue here? The um, references made to the the Human Science Research Council report by both parties. Is is it common cause that it was given to your clients, the applicants, some time ago? Is it October this year or October last year? It wasn't clear for me. Uh, 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 um, Justice Bushidi, it's, uh, it's common cause that the report was provided to the applicant in October 2020. 2020. Uh, that's correct. And it was upon the request of the applicant. So the contents thereof is common cause. It's not an issue between the parties. That's right. We don't dispute that that is the HSRC report. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see, I don't seem to get the sense that there's any further question. In which just one, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Justice Mba, just yeah. one. Uh, is it, is it, do you find it necessary to comment on the application of the PLASCON events? Not at all in this case, Justice Shongwe, because the facts are common cause. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, was Advocate Bishop, could you come on the screen? Yes, thank I'm, you. I'm here, Justice Mbarr. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I must uh, thank you both for your presentations. The, the head of argument, in fact, not only you and your, and your teams, your colleagues, um, I'm sure you will appreciate that uh, this is not quite a straightforward case and it's urgent and we have to decide it as quickly uh, as, as possible, but uh, we will do our best. Uh, I do hope that uh, you have the feeling that you are afforded uh, adequate time to present your respective cases. Uh, I also must take the opportunity to, to thank my colleagues um, in uh, hearing this matter. Um, uh, I want to thank the support staff, Anari and the others. Uh, Anari, uh, I'm going to ask you to ensure that um, everyone except my colleagues leaves the platform. Well, before I get to that, obviously judgment is reserved, uh, but uh, you know we will try and uh, get a decision uh, across to you as quickly as possible. It may well be that we might just perhaps, if we are agreed, we are still going to get into a, a post-hearing conference. Depending on how that goes, we might perhaps uh, choose to grant an order if we are in agreement and perhaps reasons to follow later. But yeah, we are going to look at all what you've said, your proposals, your counter proposals. So once again, thank you uh, for all your assistance. Uh, you are now excused. Uh, my colleagues will remain. Thank you. As the court pleases. Of course.